join us on the Path Radio Mix online. And to get there, type in thepathradio.com. That's thepathradio.com. And enjoy free streaming music all day long. That's it. thepathradio.com. All right, now let's get to the main show, the monthly social podcast with me, your host, Guido Perino, as you go on with Guido. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the monthly social. I'm your host, Guido Perino. And this month together, we will explore current events before we welcome our special music guest, Ricky Medlock from Leonard Skinner and Blackfoot as we observe Red Dress Day plus his new song dedicated to the cause. Then we catch up with Phyllis Levitt as we explore America in therapy, with mental health as the greatest threat to survival as a country and as a species. I will also share with you five ways to be nicer and the benefits of being nice, some sports talk, plus music, and other tidbits as we roll into May. So, let's go! But first, a word from one of our friends of the podcast, Johnny Prosciutto. Johnny Prosciutto, artisanal, Italian, homemade products. We make it like our grandfather, or as we say, no, no. Naturally cured, old-fashioned, and delicious. Order online at johnnyprosciutto.com. And we deliver right to your front door, where the only thing left for you to do is enjoy it with your friends and family. That's johnnyprosciutto.com. It seems that lately, every time I hear the Johnny Prosciutto promo, that uh, I have a personal experience to relate to it. And uh, it wasn't uh, recently that we had a um, birthday party, and we celebrated here at the house for one of our kids, and I had served some Johnny Prosciutto. And one of the first questions I usually get is, wow, is this your own? Uh, And I say, no, no, it's not. It's Johnny Prosciutto. And then we talk about that, and I tell them how great Johnny Prosciutto is. And then, inevitably, the conversation comes to, hey, next time you order, can you order me some too? At which point I say, hey, you can just go to johnnyprosciutto.com and order your own. And, you know, if you spend so much, there's uh, reduced shipping or sometimes free shipping. But check it out. Because the Johnny Prosciutto food experience at our home is usually a pretty good food experience for for folks who, who are enjoying it. Now, talking about uh, experiences and food experiences, part of that same party, we took the, uh, our, our kid and, and their friends to Medieval Times. Now, Medieval Times is, if you've never been, is a uh, dinner theater um, type of event where um, you're in an arena and there's horses and knights and they do battle and there's this wonderful storyline with the queen and... Uh, it's just fun. You get to cheer, you get flags. It's uh, a throwback, right? Now, the experience is from my eyes, um, you know, and what I saw and what I felt and what I heard, but our guests all seem to enjoy it. And another uh, part that, uh, of the experience that they enjoyed was the food. Uh, the, look, we didn't leave there hungry, okay? They come out and they give you... Um, you start with a tomato soup, and you can't. There's no utensils. You have to, you know, uh, sip it out of, a, of a out of a plate that has a handle. And then they come with uh, chicken, uh, a potato, corn, garlic bread, dessert, of course. But the chicken, they served us a half a chicken each, and these were not like Swiss chalet, you know, quarter chicken, small things here. Like these were not like chicken wings. This was truly a large half chicken. It became the, the experience conversation point on the way home and later in the evening as we all said, wow, that was a lot of chicken. Uh, it tasted good. It tasted good, um, which is good because, again, there was a lot of chicken. But uh, that was one of the food experiences that, that we certainly took away from there was that, um, you know, good portions, decent meal. Um, the other experience uh, was just how structured um, the staff were. Uh, They really wanted to keep people moving. They really wanted to create spaces. Um, 
They really wanted to keep things structured. And it was fine. Uh, I appreciate that because, you know, it kind of keeps you going through the to the venue and eventually to your to your seats, etc. But at times it lacked, from my experience, some situational awareness. Right? There were people who were waiting for other guests, and and you know they may have never been there, and they weren't familiar, and they didn't necessarily get things explained to them of how certain things might work. Um, the some of the staff were just very focused on. I'm told that I should move this, this group of people from spot A to spot B, and that's all I'm going to do. The conditions or the, the circumstances that everybody may have, although there may be some that are different, we're not going to focus on those. We're just going to keep people moving. And so there's just that little bit of situational awareness and, and experience, right? Now, the, the experience of getting to and from the event um, was decent. It was on a weekend. And we had arranged for some um, some travel, uh, and the ride there was was pretty decent and fun. Of course, we played some Taylor Swift because that's what the kids wanted to hear. Um, but the travel experience was was a decent travel experience for going into Toronto. It was certainly different than the experience I'd had a few days prior. I was with a colleague, and we were uh, in downtown Toronto, and. Um, we were trying to leave downtown Toronto at 3 p.m. And the traffic was so slow that it took us just over 45 minutes to travel 600 meters. That's just over a half a kilometer or just about, a, um, a, a, just over a quarter of a, of a mile, if you will, as well. And it was going so slow that at one point I said, look, we were in the car for about 20 minutes. I said, I really need to go to the washroom. I had been eyeing this restaurant. We had moved so slow. It was just, the restaurant was just there, always there, always visible. And I said, um, I'm just going to run. I'm going to go to the washroom. And so I got in traffic, stopped traffic. I got out of the car, walked to the restaurant, went to the washroom, spoke to the shop owner, left the restaurant, walked back to the car, got in the car. The car had barely moved, okay? That is not a really good travel experience. And there is very little you can say to me to convince me that if you are a business capable of remote work, that you as an owner or whether you have staff if you don't need to be somewhere where the traffic is that bad to get to and from, don't do it. If you are able to work remote, work remote. Because three hours to get from, from point A to home it doesn't, doesn't help. Um, it doesn't help any part of the person's life or the person's work life at all, right? It's, it's that situational awareness. It's understanding the experience. And, and we tend to try and say to ourselves, well, you know, but I'm going to make this other thing here better, so I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm not going to think about what it takes to get there. I just want to be there. And it's part of the experience, and it's part of the, 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 the self-awareness and, and education of understanding the whole thing. And it did. It took us three hours to get home one way. So not a, not a happy experience, if, if you will, right? And, you know, one of the other things that has popped up talking about experience is recently here in Ontario, um, there was an announcement made that next fall, we're going to take cell phones away from children. Uh, we're going to change the way that, um, you know, they can access these phones at school because they're distracted, and uh, look, I, I, I know, I know that social media and all that stuff, um, you know, has crept into the daily lives of, of kids and not just kids, adults as well, right? Um, but I don't know if, if, we're, if we've learned anything from our experiences, right? Well, we'll just take them away. We'll just say, don't do drugs. No, you can't do that, right? But what I think is, I don't know if they've tackled what the 
issue in the use of the cell phone actually is, right? Um, basically trying to understand and influence behavior. Um, why does the child need to um, be looking at social media while the teacher is teaching, if that's the case? Uh, why do they have to have that phone on them in, in, in a capacity other than education? And so I don't know if taking something away um, you know, the means to an end here. Oh, I'll just take it away because if I take it away and they don't have it in their hand, then I've solved the problem. And I don't know. I don't know if, if we've solved the problem. I don't know if that's the experience, right? I mean, look, back in my day, son, when I went to school and walked there both uphill both ways, right? Um, look, if my teacher said, hey, Guido, um, put that pen, that, that fun pen away. We didn't have cell phones, right? Put that, put your, you know, your, your novelty pen away. I put my novelty pen away. And, and that was it, right? It was, it was I, I understood the instruction. I followed it. I understood my consequences. Didn't want to deal with them. Put the pen away. No problem. I understand that right now, that may not be the case with our teacher and student relationships. And, and the question is, well, how did it get to not be that way? Right? What are the things that we need to change to empower our teachers to have that authority and, and respect. Because there's, there's two parts to it, right? I respected my teachers. They had authority, but I also respected my teachers. And that's a big difference. Now, does it fall all on the teachers? No. I said, and I, I got, you know, there's people on, online where I made some comments about it. We said, ah, you know, calling me names and other things. And, and that doesn't help anything either. We're not teaching anybody anything right, by calling each other names and, and not properly talking about it, right? But I say, well, let's understand the behavior. Let's influence the behavior. Let's teach, right? I think that um, technology has a place in our schools and in our workplaces. Obviously, we all use computers. We all use technology. How it got used, helping our teachers integrate it into their programs so that, um, you know, it, it becomes part of the experience not something that is negative or we shouldn't do or shouldn't touch, etc. If you solve that, if you've got your engagement and, you, and the tools are being used as part of the, the lesson, um, you know, uh, I don't think you, you get into some of these other areas of, of misuse. I, I'm not saying it's 100% foolproof here. I, there's always going to be kids trying to do other things. They're kids. That's what we did. We just did it with other things, not, not cell phones, right? Um, and I think at the root of it, and I've got a guest later on in the show, Phyllis, uh, you know, we talk about the root of behavior. Uh, and, and that's part of it, I think, is the root of behavior and our experience um, with trying to do that. You know, another thing, because I always like to talk about current events, is uh, in the news right now, there's a lot of talk about H5N1. Um, you know, and is it, is it a new threat? And, uh, you know, is it coming? What are we going to do? Uh, are we ready for it? Um, you know, uh, is, are humans, uh, you know, going to be threatened by H5N1? And, you know, some of the comments online or some of the, the, the path that I've seen people talk about, boy, that, the, the last pandemic really wreaked havoc on trust. And everybody has a different experience from having taken vaccines or not taken vaccines or feeling that their rights were uh, were compromised, and, and we all know what happened with some of the protests and all that stuff. But there's a, a real risk now that with H5N1 or whatever, whatever it is that comes, that we've got a portion of society that's going to say, uh-uh, I'm not going down that path again. I don't believe you. I'm going to take my bleach. Don't take bleach. <laughs> don't, do not drink bleach. Do not inject bleach. Okay, uh, and yeah, we know we know part of it is a joke, right? Um, but there's a part of society that isn't listening now to some of our, uh, you know, doctors, etc., because they have this idea that well, they're just going to try and get me to get another vaccine. It's about big pharma and it's about money and this and that, and we've lost uh, confidence in not all of us. Some of us have lost confidence in the medical. Um, uh, assessment from a science perspective. So it's all about experiences, what we've experienced, what those around us have experienced, what we choose to experience, and 
what influences those experiences in terms of situational awareness, self-awareness, and education. All right, I've ranted about so many different things here. Uh, let's get to the show. I got a great show coming up. Um, and uh, as usual, I hope that that is a great experience for you. Thank you for joining me here on The Monthly Social. I hope you have time to subscribe. Let's get to our guests. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Monthly Social Music Spotlight. I am your host, Guido Perino, and joining me today, original and current member of the Billboard chart, classic band Leonard Skinner, co-founder of the band Blackfoot, honoring American Indigenous heritage, member of the Native American Music Hall of Fame, and now focused on new music with the Ricky Medlock Band. Our featured guest, Ricky Medlock. Welcome to the show, Ricky. A true, hey. true honor to have you here. How are you? Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. No, no, me. And, and look, at you give us this beautiful background uh, today as, <laughs> as you're joining us. Woo! Looking fantastic. Those are, that's the, yeah. a, new, a new little studio there, eh? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, like I was telling you, I've created, um, <laughs> created my own mix room slash studio um, at my house in the mother-in-law suite <laughs> and um, it's separate from the house and I don't have to disturb anybody inside the home. You know, I've got it all great company named RLX did all the soundproofing and you know, the whole bit. So I can, I can play it as loud as I want to play it. So it, it looks like uh, it looks kind of cozy. It looks like, you know, it's got some character and everything, Ricky, like, uh... well, it does. I mean, uh, I, my, my better half, she's the one that, basically pick the colors the the red drapes and you know uh we've got you know i'm i'm right now slowly but surely like i was just telling you we did a whole new makeover nice. and i just finished with uh the, the new pro tools and you know all that stuff so it's kind of cool because uh you know it's it's going to come together real quick now and uh, Mark, the guy that's involved in uh, my side project, my side band, um, he basically, he has his own studio, of course. And uh, we throw music back and forth. And we're even involved in getting commercials now and, and uh, writing new music for a new song uh, for the next song we're going to put out. And uh, I'm, a, I'm just... I never stop. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny. We just got off the road, Skinner did, and with, you know, from yeah. being out with ZZ Top for two months. And so everybody says, wow, we get to go home and, you know, have a break, you know, a week off. And I come home and mine's a working week off. So <laughs> I, I just, I never stop. I never I'll, do. Uh, Ricky, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? Like seriously, you just keep keep at or keep going, man. There's no other way. I'm I'm the same way. So uh, it's inspiring you. Like I'm just listening to you. I even want to do more. Um, look, are you you're are you an original? The last time we talked, and and so folks know, uh, this is our sort of second take at this because there's other stuff going on for you and I both at the same time. And the last time we talked, you were over in Memphis. But I think you're in Florida now, and I was going to say, are, aren't, yes. you, aren't you an original Floridian, like from Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida? I am. Uh, you know, we we have new merchandise down here. Uh, it's a big thing called Flow Grown, <laughs> and uh, you know, I got the caps and the t-shirts, and the, you know, and it's and and I not to offend anybody. But I also got T-shirts that says, don't New York, my Florida, you know, and don't California, my Florida. So, oh, that's awesome. but it's all in, it's all in good fun. But I have gotten some comments and some stares out of it. And, ah. you know, hey, whatever, you know, but uh, I am a, I was born and raised in Jacksonville. Um, and my mother. Uh, was very, very young. And she, when you talk about the 50s, you know, when you're that young and you have a child, you know, at 16 years old, that wasn't really looked at favorably, you know? Yeah. Um, she 
took care of me for a little while, her and my grandmother. And my grandmother, uh, my, my, my grandma Wilma, she was the Indian on my mother's side hmm. of the family. She was Creek Cherokee. And um, I just ended up finding a beautiful picture of her and my grandfather, Shorty, who was the writer of Train Train. Um, but they had divorced by the time I came along. And my granddaddy, Shorty, had remarried a, a beautiful woman uh, named Ruby Juanita. Met Ruby Juanita. And uh, so when my mother had me, she could only take care of me so much. And I ended up being a very sickly baby mm. in and out of the hospital a lot. Um, and, and it was a real stress, I guess, on her, you know. Well, she gave me up to my, you know, my grandfather and his new uh, wife. And um, I ended up being adopted by them. Uh, on that side, I mean, that's where the music came from, you know, that side of my mother's folks, because here it was, my mother sang. I've got pictures of her in a band singing. Uh, my grandfather, here's my grandfather, an extraordinary musician, played in and out of Nashville with a lot of your old uh, country stars. Uh, and he was basically a road guy, you know, he did some Nashville stuff, but and um, so they adopted my grandfather and his new wife, which was my grandmother. Yeah. But they ended up being my parents and raising me. And, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I was I think I was a very uh, I think I was very a fortunate child to have the, that kind of rearing because um, I was like I said, I was in and out of the hospital a lot. Um, it's not widely known, but. It has kind of leaked out in the last dozen or so years. I have a uh, I have a respiratory illness called pulmonary fibrosis, and um, which you know when I joined Skinner to play drums, that's very challenging. But um, I've been able to, you know, do certain things and take certain steps in my life with help. Um, to really stay, you know, on top of it. You know what I mean? But um, thank God I had them because they really had me back and forth to so many doctors. And I spent so much time in the hospitals and all this stuff, you know. But I um, had a pretty serious operation when I was about nine and a half. Took part of my lung and, you know, I basically all at one. And um, doctors basically said I wouldn't live. I wouldn't live to see fourteen years of age. And now all of a sudden I'm seventy four, and I went, okay, I guess I beat that one. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so much for what doctors know, right? <laughs> but uh, you know what, man? Uh, all in all, being born and raised in Florida. Actually, you know, I'm glad that I was because down here it was a, a really the vibe back then in that era uh, was just incredible. Um, first of all, being in Jacksonville, we had so many shows coming through that part of the state. You had 95 North and South ran through Jacksonville, still does. Interstate 10 East and West runs through it, you know. Then close by is Interstate 75. And um, so what ended up happening was, is that you would get a lot of bands and a lot of artists coming down to Florida to play. And they would play Jacksonville. Uh one of my earliest shows uh, when I was six, almost seven years old, my parents um, took me to see Elvis Presley. 
when the king was really the king. Yeah. Uh, that was in late 1956. And how the story was, how it happened, uh, my mom and dad knew a lady named May Axton. And she was Hoyt Axton's aunt. Um, May had an appointment, her and a guy named Tommy Durden <laughs> and a guy named Glenn Reeves, and they had a song. And the song they had, they wanted to play it for Elvis because Elvis was in town for two nights. He did his first night. And um, so the next day, May and Tommy... Durden, they were able to go up to his hotel and they sat down and they played him the song and he loved it. And he said, the only way I'll do it, and Elvis always did this anyway, uh, you can read his history, but Elvis always wanted 50% of the song. Didn't matter who wrote it. He mm -hmm. wanted 50%. Well, they agreed to that. And actually, from what I understand, the third writer, Glenn Reeves, only wrote 5% of the movie, so they cut him out altogether, <laughs> which would have been, in today's terms, probably a huge lawsuit. Yeah. Well, um, the song that I'm talking about ends up being Heartbreak Hotel. No way. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, May ended up getting three tickets to see Elvis that night. She couldn't go, and she gave my mom and dad the three tickets and took, their, took Ricky to see Elvis. Well, I was already listening to the radio and listening to rock and roll at that young age. Uh, my mom and dad used to tell the story about they would – get up at night and go into my room and I'd be asleep with the transistor radio under my pillow, <laughs> listening to the local rock, rock mm -hmm. and roll radio station. <laughs> well, I got to see Elvis and on the way home, uh, as my dad would tell you, uh, on the way home, he said, he, I, was, I was in the middle between him and my mind. He said, well, son, what did you think of that? And I looked at him, and he, he told the story over and over. I looked at him, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to yeah. do that. So here I am. Did you? Uh, but there's, Ricky, you, there's so much juicy stuff there that you gave us. Um, did, you get your, did you pick up any, like, Elvis the Pelvis type of moves on stage? Or did you, did you try and uh, shake it a little? Nah. <laughs> I was always really... <laughs> And if you rewind, I've got pictures. I could probably find them for you on my phone and I'll show them. I'll put it up to the camera. But I had already, believe it or not, my grandfather, when I got to be three years old, he saw that I was interested in uh, stringed instruments already. Yeah. And no, Ricky, he told me. Hold on, before you tell us that, like, and, and you yeah. mentioned it, this is Paul Shorty Medlock, and, and Paul right. Shorty Medlock is your grandfather. He's, he's into blues country, bluegrass. He's doing all yeah. that stuff. And you, you, you threw out earlier, Train Train. Uh, he, so he contributed to the, to the song Train Train, which Blackfoot, uh, one of your bands, uh, right. that's, that's their song, right? So I just well, wanted to set wrote, that up. I wanted to set that up. He wrote the song in 1938 right and yeah. recorded it and recorded it years later but if you go back he taught me how to play banjo yeah uh, he bought me a miniature banjo and taught me how to play banjo at the age of three and <laughs> um he was on a local tv show when he'd come off the road he was on a local tv show called the toby dowdy show and um, he went to Toby one day and he says, my grandson and I, um, I've taught him how to play a uh, banjo and I bought him a miniature banjo and I would like to bring him on the show 
and let him do a song with me. And Toby said to him, well, how old is your grandson? He goes, he's three. He went, come on, three? He said, I got to see this, Shorty. So he brings me on the next week on a Saturday night, and the show was simulcast through the CBS affiliate, WMBR, which is now WJXT in Jacksonville. So I go on, I appear on the show with him, we do a song, and I stayed for five years on the show <laughs> till I was eight. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you, do you, so that's, inc- that's an incredible story. So you start playing on a show at three for five years. Do you remember going regularly and, and doing the shows and? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when my dad had to be on the road, I was so bummed out that we weren't going that weekend. <laughs> But at the same time, he would take my mind, me on the road with him sometime. Right. And that was a whole new different experience. So I got used to being on the road at a very early age. Um, I don't like coming off tour. Uh, Gary and Johnny years ago would laugh at me. We'd be doing 75, 80, 100 shows. And at the end of the tour, I'd be like, oh, man. I don't want to go home. You know, I want to see, I want to keep playing. They were like, Oh my God, get this guy out of here. You know, this guy, he's uh, a little too much for us, you know, but um, what it is, I just really love playing mm-hmm. and um, I want to play as long as I can. Right. And, you know, I, I, when I think about it, I learn how to play guitar at, five years old drums when I was eight years old mm-hmm. and I I kind of never looked back and I and and my parents you know they had everything to do with it they let me uh explore what I what was naturally given to me uh you know by the by a higher power and I owe it all to them I mean, I do. I really do. Because, you know, a lot of parents would have looked at it and go, eh, you know, that music business, you know, you're never going to do anything in that, you know. But not my parents. I mean, my parents were like, yeah, uh, go for it, you know. Yeah. And here we sit today talking, you know. <laughs> that That's a that's a, a an amazing story. Like, there's so many parts of it that are, are amazing. Um, when you're you say, I don't want to stop playing. I don't want to come off tour. Um, are you, when you're playing, are you just somewhere else, Ricky? Like, are you just, uh, are you home? Is that, is that what it is? Uh, yes, I, uh, yes, I am. Mm-hmm. I, I'll be real honest. You know, I love being at home with my loved ones. Uh, I have a very beautiful lady in my life. She's my life's partner. Um, just as talented as anybody I've ever seen. She has sang with virtually, I still don't know. I've been with her 16 years, and I still don't know everybody she's been with. She'll all of a sudden, will be sitting at the table having coffee or eating dinner or whatever. And next thing I know, she's been with this band or sang with this artist or whatever. And I'm like, what you know <laughs> but um that's how we met i mean that's i mean how we met was she was one of the backing vocalists in kid rock All right, and um in 2008 kid rock and leonard skinner did two back-to-back tours yeah. and that's how we met and that's you know that's how it all happened and as they say the rest um, is the rest is history uh ricky Yes, yeah. and now she's with Leonard Skinner. She sings with right us. Right on. Right on. And, um, you know, the next thing is I have a, you know, I love, don't misunderstand me. I love being with family, and, and I love fishing. I go fishing to kind of air out my, you know, my head. And, you know, I have a beautiful daughter, uh, one daughter, man, that she's just doing 
so great in her life. And uh, she has a great job and, you know, the, the whole bit's got a great guy in her life. And, you know, I'm happy for her. But when it really gets right down to it, um, I really am the happiest uh, when I'm standing there playing. When I'm standing on stage and I'm and I'm able to see all these people enjoying the music and and they got these they got a smile on their face and they've forgotten about their blues and their troubles, and, yeah. you know, with all the events of the day. <laughs> um, I believe here recently I told my manager I said you know standing there on stage playing that guitar and is probably uh, I'm the happiest ever, you know, every day. And I look forward to that hour and a half every night, you know? And man, so, and that's, I, I want to go, you know, right there, there's a reason to go see you live right there. Um, I, I, I want to know Ricky. And I, and you know, I think fans, when we go to shows, we want to know that um, the artist is playing for us that night. Right. And, and we know that the artist played the night before or the night before that or something. But we want to know that the artist is playing for us that night. And and what I think I'm hearing from you is I'm playing for you that night. We don't I'm playing for whoever's there. I love it so much. I'm playing for you. I've. Up until COVID. I had never canceled a show in my whole life. Uh, which kind of freaked everybody out because of the respiratory illness that I got. When I caught COVID, everybody was just like, uh -oh. you know, just terrified. Um, but I have a, I have a great physician with a great staff and, uh, they saved my life. And so, um, I give it all to them. Ricky. But can I, I, let me ask you a question about that, the, the pulmonary fibrosis. And you kind of said, you know what, um, it, it's only, maybe only recently been leaked. Only a few people might know. Um, you had it all these years. Was there a, did you ever have a fear that if they find out, they're going to think some, something less of me as a musician or, or they might not, they're like, oh man, I don't know about that guy because of this. Or was it ever anything like that? Or just, it was just a private no, I mean. No, I'd get in fight in, in bars and, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't stop me from doing too much. <laughs> uh, stop me from being an athlete, but, you know, yeah. who cares? I'm an athlete in my own right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I never really, I never really thought about that. And I never really much. And if I had them, I probably wouldn't have much cared because I love doing what I'm doing. And I, Figured, hey, I'm going to continue doing this anyway. Uh, it's not going to stop me. And uh, you know what? I'm, I've learned. I've learned how to take care of myself, and I've learned how to deal with it. And now, uh, with modern, uh, modern things that's happening, I'm even able. To, in fact, I just saw my doctor yesterday, and uh, he looked at me and he said, "My God, you look great, Ricky." He said, um, he's trying to get my genomics um, to where right now I'm 74, but the inside my genomics, I'm about 60. And what we're trying to do is break it down to where, you know, um, as, at the age I'm at, and I'm trying to get down into my 50s, uh, my genomics and my, you know, my body chemistry. Yeah. So... It takes work. Um, I sure did. <laughs> I sure gave up all the extracurricular things that I used to do. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't keep doing what you do when you're in your early late twenties, early thirties, and expect to reach that mountain. You know, there's been a lot that's tried it, and they there's been a lot that failed. But uh, you know what, man. It's more important to play music. Music is my music is my drug of choice and always has been. I mean, even some of the lowest times of my life, 
uh, music always pulled me through it. Um, you know, when my dad shortly passed away uh, in 82, I shut myself off from the world. Hmm. From the band and everything in 82, I shut myself off for a month, you know. And all I did was play guitar, play guitar, play guitar. And that brought me out of it and brought and brought forth a lot of songs that I started writing. So music uh, is my drug of choice. It's always been my mistress. It's always been, you know, my, my best friend. It's always been my travel partner. It's been everything along with my guitars and, you know, the whole bit. And, uh, it's at, it's, at, like, it's, at, it's at your core. It's at your core, Ricky, right? So let's let's ease a little bit more into some of the music stuff here. Um, you know, as fans are engaging with your content over on your site, rickymedlock.com, um, yeah. we have fans and listeners that want to hear uh, about your music journey, and we're giving them, you're giving them that and more tonight. Um, loving loving the, the information and content that you've given us and shared some very, some very personal things. So thank you for that. Um, but your music journey, uh, let's, if I can just go back a little bit, you mentioned Skinnerd a few times and we've mentioned Blackfoot a few times. You're an original member of Skinnerd, right? How did, how did that originally come to be? Like, <laughs> like... <laughs> well, um, in 1969, um, Blackfoot had formed under a, a different name. Uh, we were called Hammer. And we got the opportunity to go to New York City. And we got the opportunity to sign with a record label that was a subsidiary to Columbia. It was called Bell Records. And the girl, the lady that found us in Gainesville, Florida, she at the time was like an A&R artist, mm -hmm. A&R person for the record label. And she's the one that ended up getting us to move up there and to start to work with Bell Records in coming up with a great record. Um, little did we know that they were wanting something else out of us, more, I call it bubblegum pop music, and, you know. And we were far from that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we ended up getting a tape one day, and the, it was a demo tape, and lo and behold, it was a song called Knock Three Times, <laughs> you know, that Tony Orlando ended up doing, and it just really bummed me out. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so we, uh, we had moved out of New York City into New Jersey. And things weren't really going well. And I was getting really frustrated because there was a relationship that had formed between the drummer uh, and, the, and the management. Okay. Um, I got frustrated and decided, you know what? I want out. And... Um, so I happened to know how to, I, I happened to be able to get a hold of Alan Collins. And I called up Alan and I said, Alan, uh, Ricky Medlock, he said, hey, man, uh, what's going on? And I said, well, thought I'd give you a call. I'm really frustrated at what's going on with me right now. And he goes, well, where are you? And I said, New Jersey. He goes, yeah, we heard that you guys had moved up there. And see, you got to understand, um, <laughs> it's really interesting. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were called Mud Crutch. Then there was Leonard Skinner. Then there was, there was Hammer, us, that turned into Blackwood. Well, Tom Petty, he gathered up his guys and they went to L.A. We gathered up our guys. We went to New York. And Skinner stayed where they were. Um, so we moved out to Jersey. I was unhappy. I got all of Allen. And he said, um, do you still play drums? And I said, oh, absolutely. 
He said, you need to call Ronnie. So I called up Ronnie Van Zandt and um, got all of Ronnie. Ronnie answered the phone, he, you know, and I said, Ronnie, uh, Ricky Medlock. He said, hey, man, how are you? I said, I'm doing good, pretty good. You know, he goes, what's going on? And I said, well, I just talked to Alan. And Alan told me to give you a call right away. And he goes, I said, um, he asked me, uh, did I still play drums? I said, what's that all about? He said, well, we're losing Bob Burns, the first drummer. And we're to start our first record in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, (laughs) at Muscle Shoals Sound in two weeks. And I went, I'm your guy. Boom. (laughs) Well, pardon me. Um, They bought me a plane ticket. And I sold off my amp and a few things, but I kept my guitars. And um, lo and behold, man, I um, (laughs) went down to Jacksonville, flew in. They met me at the airport. We stopped by my parents' home. On the way to rehearsal, we started rehearsing that night. And we stopped by my parents' home. And here's my dad out on our front porch playing his guitar with a heart rack on and heart. And Ronnie goes, is that shorty? I said, yeah. He goes, oh man, listen to that. So we all got out and they crowded around my dad. Well, that was the beginning of really Ronnie just being stuck on my dad (laughs) and and his inspiration. Therefore, later on, as you well maybe well know, yeah. Ronnie wrote Curtis Lowe with my old man in mind. Him and Sunhouse, the blues singer. Well, um, we went to rehearsal that night and started working on what is now uh, called Litter Skinner's first and last album, mm. or the whole Muscle Shoals collection. Right. I'm drums on basically almost all of that. Um, I played acoustic guitar on it. I sang vocals. I sang backing vocals. A lot of stuff, you know? So that was the beginning at that time, early on in 71. Yeah. And I stayed through almost 73, two and a half years. Yeah. So again, incredible and shorty, incredible. Um, and we have a lot of amazing history because of that. Um, but you leave, you leave Skinner after two and a half years. Yep. And you go to black. Well, what happened? It got to be, you know, with what's going on here. Um, it was, it was hard. Yeah. You got to have a, a lot of breathing capacity to play drums, um, a lot of air intake, you know. And I really felt like, honestly, and I discussed it with Ronnie and the guys, I, I felt honestly that I wasn't doing fairly by them because, uh, as, as I said to them, um, you guys need somebody better than me. Um, I, I, I have this condition, you know, and it's, you guys just need somebody that's going to take you, that's going to be more badass than I am and take you forward. And Ronnie was like, man, what are you talking about? We love the way you play. You know, you're a part of us. <laughs> Little did I know that later on, this would be a real difficult thing to think about. But um, I left and we got Blackfoot back together. And uh, I remember my old man saying something to me, man, that stuck with me forever. And he said, uh, 
you know, I really feel that those guys are really going to do something. That singer, Ronnie, he goes, that boy Ronnie, there's something about him. And he goes, and, and it's all together, and he goes, Ricky, you're with a great bunch of guys. And he goes, if you leave and they make it, you're going to have to live with that the rest of your life if you don't make it. And I got to be, I got to tell you, I thought about it and thought about it. And I still decided that I was going to, to leave. And I did. They went on, you know, they put out the pronounced record and Freebird took off. Then they put out their second record and boom, they had a smash hit with Alabama and they were off and running. Then they did their third one. And if you look on there, <clears throat> pardon me, if you look on it, there's a song called Made in the Shade on their Nothing Fancy record, right? Yeah. Well, my dad used to tell all of us, <laughs> you boys keep doing what you're doing, and one of these days you're going to have it made in the shade. <laughs> Ronnie wrote a song, dedicated the song to my old man, and then not only that, he wrote or he, he dedicated the whole Nothing Fancy record to my old man and um then later on it was what it became known that my old man was part of the inspiration for curtis lowe and listen you know what i was able to work um uh, next to ronnie and alan and and of course billy leon and gary and all that but Ronnie was a very, he was a tough guy, but he was a very special guy. If you think of it in terms, and think about this, think about it in terms, the boy uh, was taken away from us by the time he was 30, mm -hmm. right before he was 30 years old. If you think about those lyrics that he wrote in all those songs, he was a genius. I called him the very original first Southern poet hmm. because he was, he could, he could write these lyrics that everybody could get next to. And we've had, I mean, we've had a lot of great writers in our lives. You know, some of my, I, I'm the biggest fan. One of the biggest fans of the Beatles and uh, and especially, I'm, I'm a huge fan of George Harrison. I mean, George Harrison to me was just like, whoa, you know. Um, look at all these guys. Look at Bob Seger. You can't get no finer than Bob Seger. But mm -hmm. I put Ronnie right up there with those guys. Because <laughs> he just had a gift. And, you know, it was interesting Gary and I were talking about it, and Gary said it. He goes, you get one genius in your family, and you've done it all. <laughs> and I thought about that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, pretty well much, you know. But um, we went on to do that record, and I left. And they made it. And I was proud for them. I mean, I really was. I was, I was happy for them. We put out two records in 75 and 76. Blackfoot did that I like to joke and say, oh, yeah, they went vinyl. They didn't go platinum or gold. They went vinyl. And uh, we struggled uh, for another two and a half years. And the next thing I know, <laughs> um, I'm home. I'm in Jacksonville. And um, I, um, I go to my parents, and um, I happen to be there, and I, and I knew that Ronnie and the guys, somehow I found out they were in town, and they had built a studio over in Riverside. 
And I asked Daddy, I said, man, you want to go over and see Ronnie and the guys? He was like, yeah, let's go. So they were getting ready. They had just cut the Street Survivors record. And they were getting ready to go on the road. And um, so we go over there. And shortly, right when we walked up, Ronnie come pulling up in his little Mercedes and and uh, he gets out and he goes, oh my gosh, Shorty, you know. He hugged my dad, you know, and he hugged me and we said our hellos and everything. He said, Ricky, how are you? I said, I'm all right, man. He goes, y'all come on in, come on in here, man. And he had the guy that run in the studio, had him to put up the Street Survivors record and he played us one song. That smell. And we listened to it, and my dad had a really interesting look on his face. And um, so when it was all over, uh, as we were leaving, Ronnie said, Ricky, we got our own airplane. Um, You want to come ride with us for a week? And I said, oh, man, I'd love to. He said, man, you could just hang out. Or maybe get up and play with us or jam with us or whatever. And um, I said, oh, man, I'd love it, you know. My dad wasn't too keen on it, you know. He had a vibe about something that was weird, you know. Well, two days before it was to go, and I found out here not too long ago that Johnny was going to go on that trip. Mm. So a couple of days before it, before I was going to go, because we didn't have no shows, Blackfoot did. A couple of days before we were going to go, um, I get a call from our agent, and he's booked two weeks worth of dates, so I couldn't go. Well, they go on the road, we go on the road. They played Greenville, South Carolina. That was their last show. We as Blackfoot was pulling up that day into our whole entourage was pulling into Columbia, South Carolina. As they were leaving, flying out of Greenville, right down the road. Hmm. That's how close fate was. Hmm. Destiny or whatever. Yeah. Well, Johnny's mom and daddy wouldn't let him go because he had to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> so years later, after I rejoined the band in 96, um, I was in Columbia that night. I, well, I don't want to get off this, but I was in Columbia that night, and uh, I found out by a series of events, we're playing a show, and some, I don't know, some guy come running up on the side of the stage saying, hey, didn't you play in Leonard Skinner? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, your boys just had a plane crash. Mm. And I said, somebody get this guy out of here, man. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we finished the show, my guitar tech uh, that, you know, was taking care of me, he says, Ricky, it's true. It's came over the news, you know. Well, I rushed back to the hotel. Mm. And when I got back to the hotel, of course, there was a blinking light on the phone and and, um, pardon me, and I pick up the phone. I didn't even listen to a messenger. And I picked up the phone, called my mom and dad's. Phone didn't even ring one time. My dad picked it up. And I said, Pop, tell me it ain't so. He goes, no, it's true. And he said, they just they just announced over the TV that Ronnie's one of the wow. people that has perished. Yeah. And, uh, man, you know. I thought to myself at that time, damn, you know? So fast forward to me rejoining the band and uh, we did our first tour together, 96. We went on the road and uh, we did, uh, we did Europe. We're playing in Europe uh, at the end of 96. And uh, we are, get on the bus, and they got those double-decker buses. And we get up in the front lounge, and you can see out over London. And so Gary and Dale are sitting up there. 
and I'm sitting right next to Gary. And he slaps me on the arm. And I look over at him. He goes, where were you? Well, it's on the anniversary in 96 that we were in London. It was on the anniversary of the plane crash. Hmm. And he said, where were you? I went, where was I? He goes, you know, where were you? I said, oh. I said, Gary, we were pulling into Columbia, South Carolina, as you guys were leaving. Taking off. And I said, Gary, I always thought maybe had I have been there, I might have been able to say something or do something or that might have made a difference. He goes, Ricky, look, no, there was no stopping it. That's the way it was going to be. And he goes, to be honest with you, Ricky, wasn't meant for you to be there then. It's meant for you to be here now. Mm. Yeah. And, and so, and so that comes full circle, Ricky, um, from, from you originally being with the band or any time after that, with all these things that have, that took place between then and, and, and these events, do you ever sit there with any type of regret and say, I shouldn't have left? I know, I know you said I was, yeah, I'd made my decision and I was good with leaving, but at any point in time, do you look back and go, man, I shouldn't have left? I've never had that question posed to me. Sorry. But no, 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 that's, that's okay. Um, I guess I do uh, in some ways. And it, because in some ways, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I might, I could have been one of those people that, made a difference i don't know uh i guess we'll never know yeah for, for I, was, reasons- I was able to i was able to get along with ronnie really well um and, and i don't I, I don't understand it's weird because i mean he was a tough guy he was tough on everybody but for some reason maybe it was because of my old man he respected my old man so much and he knew that i you know, had the talent and I knew what I was doing because I played drums and guitar and I sang and, you know, the whole bit. Maybe it was because of that. But um, I got to tell you, when I was working with him, man, he was great to me and um, straight up. And I loved working with him. Um, I loved him like, you know, I loved him like a brother. You know, we all did. We all loved each other like a brother. And, um, you know, I guess maybe if I'd have been there, uh, maybe I could have. Maybe I could have made a difference and said something that would have made a difference. But you know what? Like Gary said, uh, Destiny Road was laid out in front of him. And uh, you know what? Bless his heart. I mean, here he is. He was the final founding member yeah. uh, to get off the bus, you know. And um, you know what? Uh, it's been a little bit more than a year. And I, I took it, it, it was really raw in my heart. I mean, I, I basically couldn't look at, we do a tribute to Gary every night uh, with the song Tuesday's Gone. And Tuesday's Gone, like, probably is one of my all-time favorite songs. And my ma just loved that song. And, of course, Simple Man and, you know, all the other great ones, Free Bird and Alabama and all that. But, you know, it's gotten, I've just now gotten comfortable. Uh, It took me over a year to be able to look at that video Hmm. that's showing up behind us. I mean, I'm standing there watching the audience and they're looking at it. And I'm like, I remember I tried to look at it after about a month or month and a half. And I just, I couldn't, I, I, you know, I really got emotional about it. And, you know, I miss the guy. I really do. You know, I spent a lot of years with him. Ricky, I often ask a guest on my show, you know, I I ask them something, something along the lines of what's your identity? Who do you want people to know who you are? 
And in this last question that I just asked you, I think we know who you are because you said, <laughs> I, you know, I, I say to you, basically, I say to you, any regrets for, for you know, leaving? And you say, yeah, but it's not for the things that I think people would say, oh, he regrets, you know, being on the tour and having the songs, being in the album and all the, all the sort of, you know, the, the fame of it. It's, but if I was there, we might have had a different outcome. And that's yeah. who Ricky Medlock is, right? Like, like that's the identity. That's the, that's the same guy who loves being there for people on stage as it is. It's the guy who says, man, these people who I loved, who were, who were my stage family, we could have had something different. Maybe I, I could have made a difference life-wise, right? Which is, uh, it got me a little choked up. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, the thing is, you got to realize something. You know, think about it in this terms, okay? I never, I never pro professed to be an incredible uh, guitar player. I think I'm good, but there's been a lot of guys that's just whoa, way better than Ricky Medlock. And, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, I have my heroes that in my, in my book that are better than me, but what I have done in my life, I've given it everything that I've had, you know, I've given it my all. And every night I walk out on that stage, I've been on stage with 103 fever before and just just didn't even hardly know where I was. But it was all because those people showed up for that show. And I had to go out there. It's what I that's what I am. And that's who I am. And the, and the thing is, uh. I never thought about being a, a rock star. I never, you know, to me, when I was a, when I was young, what I wanted to do was play guitar and I had my little amp and I wanted to be able to just pick up my guitar, my amp, walk into a club, play, maybe get paid a few dollars and walk out. <laughs> I thought that's what my life, <laughs> I thought that's what my life was going to be. Little did I know um, I was going to be with, you yeah. know, two great, incredibly, yeah. you know, world renowned Southern rock bands. A absolutely. Uh, Let, Ricky, let's talk about, um, I want to transition a little bit to, to Blackfoot, uh, because I, I, I want to get to some of the stuff that you're doing yeah. right now too. So look at, at the time Blackfoot was born as a, as a brand, you did yeah. so with some intention to represent the indigenous heritage uh, present in the band with Jackson Spires having uh, Cheyenne and Cherokee roots, yourself with Lakota Sayu, uh, Blackfoot, yeah. and uh, Creek Cherokee, Greg Walker with Muskogee Creek. Uh, yeah. and, and seeing the evolution of understanding, connecting, uh, and respecting indigenous heritage today, do you think that you were ahead of your time? in the naming of your band or do you see it as, as uh, you know, could you see it today as one of the building blocks to where we are getting to when it comes to indigenous culture? Well, at the time uh, of Blackfoot, uh, each guy, Jackson, Greg, and myself, we knew our, our original roots and we knew where we, you know, we knew our, our heritage and, and how it came about was we had had the name Hammer, and then we found out somebody had that name over in England. And then we named our band, believe it or not, Free. And then all of a sudden, All Right Now came out, and we had to change our name. The next thing you know, Jackson was the one that suggested, let's name the band Blackfoot. We got, you know, three natives in the band. Let's name the band, band Blackfoot. It sounds like the music. It sounds like the, the, the image we're going after, you know, so forth and so on. Well, all of a sudden, we had another Native American band, Redbone, came out with Come and Get Your Love. Mm -hmm. And we felt like we were right on the money. We said, hey, you know, we're doing 
probably what we need to be doing. Yeah. And um, we never, we never look back. I mean, um, we were proud of it. We were proud of what we had accomplished. And uh, you know what? Were we ahead of our time? Maybe. But you know what? We were heavier than a lot of your Southern bands. We didn't fall into this category of Southern boogie or redneck rock or whatever. Johnny Van Zandt even likes to say that (laughs) he always felt that Blackfoot was the original Southern heavy metal band. And uh, I would probably pretty well much agree with that because I got to tell you, Europe took to us like you take the cake and ice cream. I mean, they, we, man, if it hadn't have been for the business, the business, Blackfoot would have conquered all of Europe so big and it would have rolled from there. But what happened? (laughs) The head of our record company over here in America didn't like us going over to England and uh, they got into a big tiff back and forth. And guess who got caught in the middle of it? We did. The music. Then the next thing, Man. well, yeah. and all of a sudden we don't get the support. We don't get this. We don't get that. And it all came tumbling down. Caused uh-huh. fights in the band, friction in the band. And uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I warn young artists, I've had them talk to me and ask me about, you know, the music business, okay? <laughs> and I always say, always understand, it is the music business, you know? Yeah. It's not grab your guitar and, oh, man, I'm loving playing, you know, and I'm going to have a million dollars and I'm going to be riding around in a Lamborghini, and, you know, nah. Don't happen that way, pal. <laughs> yeah, you know it, it's true. Like, like the you know the music is is, the, is sort of the output, right? You're out there on stage, and like you say, I'm doing what I love. But everything that gets you, like the wrapper around it, the the, the things that lead up to it, it's it's uh, it's complicated. <laughs> it's, well, just it's, think, just it just think. The biggest payday of my whole life was when Gary Rossington said. If you pass the audition, I'll I'll wrap up a dollar fifty in a Snickers bar and I'll put you in the band. <laughs> that was my biggest payday. <laughs> and then and then I climbed up on the bus years later, not thinking about it, and I'm worn out after Freebird. I'm sweating, and I look up on the galley counter in the bu- on the bus, and I see this thing there, and I walk by, and there's a note. And I pick it up, <laughs> and it says, Ricky, paid in full. It was a dollar <laughs> fifty wrapped up in a, with a Snickers bar. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> so and you that, just, was my, that was my biggest payday. And you, you know? just and you just plugged Snickers, by the way. Snickers, you just got free advertising from Ricky Medlock. You're you darn opened- right. Sit- yeah, we get free ones now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, so Blackfoot, um, it, it, I mean, it doesn't go away. Blackfoot doesn't go away. You, you, it, you know, it, it, you keep playing, iterations of it happen. The website right now, officialblackfoot.com, suggests that the current band lineup is on hiatus. Uh, other members of the band say they've stepped down from representing the, the brand Blackfoot. Uh, what's that about right now? Will we see Blackfoot come back in, in some capacity or...? In my in my in my opinion, no. Okay. Um, I had put together this young group, and I had cut a record on them, Southern Native, and it came out. And it they started getting gigs, and they started to. It wasn't chin in the world by all means, but they were starting to get their bearings and their wheels going. And so then. I cut a, another record on them. And the next thing I know, um, they didn't want me as the producer. And I was like, well, whoa, wait a minute. The deal is I cut this record on you. 
we're getting great reviews on it, yeah. that it sounds good and it sounds great. And I've got a new record cut on you guys. Uh, you want to get another producer? Well, the deal was they could go out under the name Blackfoot. I mean, they, I got them on Skinner shows. They were, yeah. they were starting to get their bearings. And I said, the deal was you can go out, you can use the name Blackfoot, but I have to be the producer and you know, that's it. I have to produce the records. Next thing you know, they don't want to do that. So I say, guess what, guys? I'm out. Okay, I'm Mr. Wonderful. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the way it went. So right now we're going to let Blackfoot's going to rest uh, for now. Well, I, I got the name. I own the name, and I put it away. Yeah. And uh, you know what, man? It's funny. I just – it's so weird that you're saying this because I was just met – um, a couple um, at my favorite restaurant that I like to go and eat a salad. And um, <laughs> they come up to me and they ask me, are you ever going to do uh, put together a Blackfoot run? Hmm. And I looked at them, honestly, and I said, honestly, no, I'm not. And I said, here's listen to what I'm telling you. When you're young and you're hungry for making it, there's a spirit about yourself. There's a drive, you know, the want, the need. And I've seen bands try to, that they, that's had all this success and then they break up or whatever. Then they come back together and they just don't quite have the essence of what they were. Yeah. And you know what? And I, I tell this to everybody. If I were going to do it and I were going to entertain that idea, then Jack would have to be alive. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, the drummer, because he was my partner in writing all the songs mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and being on stage doing what we did. So therefore I just, you know what? Jack's gone. The essence and the spirit of what it was is gone. And um, I, I'm, you know what, man, I'm into all this other stuff now. I, yeah. I love thinking about those days and I appreciate it. And uh, I cherish those memories. I really do. Yeah. I mean, we, we accomplished Man, we accomplished a hell of a lot. And, uh, you know, we sold we sold gold. We sold platinum. Uh, and, hey, you know what? We had a good run. But okay. now, you know, I promised Gary Rossington that I would be in Leonard Skinner till the last note in Freebird was played. Here I am. That's uh, Listen, that's a fair way to uh, allow us to enjoy the legacy of, of Blackfoot. Um, look, is it? I'm going to, I'm asking you hard questions. Maybe, uh, is it true that you and, uh, Johnny Van Zandt have been considering a new Skinner album? Um, if you do, what would we expect to hear from it, from that type well, of Well, here's, I will tell you this much. We are considering it and yeah. we are looking into it. We have, uh, we have a lot of material lying around that Gary was, I mean, he was a writer with us yeah. in all this material. And I mean, there's a lot of it. So Johnny and I got to thinking, why let all that go to waste? Um, yeah. Let's talk about this. Let's explore this. Let's get into this. And um, let's see what comes of it next year. Is uh, we, um, is it going to be a hard album to do without Gary Rosington? Uh, for me, probably. But you know what? I know he's with us. 
and I know he'll be sitting over here, you know, whispering <laughs> in mayor, come on, you son of a bitch, play it, you know. <laughs> and uh <laughs> but um it will be. I mean, yeah. look, there is not a night that goes by on that stage that I don't miss the guy. I miss him. Um, I got the most wonderful picture of Gary and I, man. It was just incredible. And uh, it was taken on stage uh, on Freebird with Ronnie's hat between us and the, the light is shining down on us. And we're looking at each other. And um, that picture says it all for me. Hmm. Uh, it really does. And uh, one day when I have to get off the bus, I hope that he he's there to greet me along with maybe Ronnie and, eh. and Alan and my dad and my mom and everybody. And I hope they shake my hand. I hope I don't get popped in the face, you know. <laughs> I, you know what man from from what i've uh learned from you just in this this conversation tonight i'm i'm pretty sure you're gonna get a big a big old hug look uh while you're considering the new skinner stuff and and man i'm I'm looking forward to that if, if you end up doing that you've also got the ricky medlock band right now and yep. band includes the two marks mark Werple and uh, mark westland on guitars steve Sodersom yep. on drums super j johnny kite on bass Yep. Uh, what do we expect from the Ricky Medlock band as this group comes together and, and gives us music? Well, one of the re- well, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was because, uh, you know, when I come off the road, like I just told you in the very beginning of this interview, mm-hmm. I can't stand being off the road. I mean, I can't, I can't stand sitting around at home and not playing and not making music. One of the things that I love about having my own studio, I can walk out, you know, I can walk out of my house into my studio. I can pick up a guitar. I can create. Uh, Right now, um, Mark Warple and I are developing music for commercials, maybe. Uh, We're developing uh, a new song uh, to put out. Another one. Yeah. Uh, We're, you know, but... I can't just not be doing something in music. It it drives me crazy. And uh, I can only fish so long. <laughs> and then fishing gets boring, uh, especially if I'm not catching any damn thing. <laughs> and uh, I love being in my boat, running up and down the river or going out to the Gulf or whatever, but yeah. you can only do that so long. <laughs> so... Um, Mark and I are going to stay on this. Uh, hopefully we're going to do more shows. And, uh, you know, we are, you know, at some point we will. And, uh, you know, we'll just keep it rolling. But you know what? Uh, the Skinner thing is my, is my number one. I'm loyal to. I hear you. I'm such, I'll tell you something, man. It's interesting. A lot of times I've questioned myself about loyalty uh, I've been, you know, how loyal I've been to people and and certain situations and and sometimes I think it, I think it was the wrong thing to do, but you know what? To me, it was the right thing, and uh, that's the way I am. And you know, like uh, the lady in my life, I'm loyal to her, and and uh, you know what, man? I can't, I couldn't ask for any better. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. I, she, uh, she's, she's, she's the best, you know? So, uh, and plus, plus I get to hear her sing around the house all the time. So (laughs) I'm, uh, I'm doing good. She's going to hear this. You're, you're, you're giving her all these props. You're getting something, something extra and something special after she listens to the show there, uh, Ricky. Look, (laughs) Loyalty runs deep here and um, you, you do things for, for people and you're doing something special with your new song, Never Run Out of Road, uh, that you co-wrote. A portion of the yeah. proceeds from downloads and streams of the song are in support of the missing and murdered indig- Indigenous women, the MMIW movement, and will yes. be directed to the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, the NIWC. Yes. 
Can you share with us why you pick that movement and what it means to you? Well, I had tried to do, oh gosh, this has been what now? Five years ago, six years ago or whatever. Um, I tried to do a TV show. Um, and it was about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and I tried to do it through a very famous actor, uh, out of Hollywood, his production company. And, uh, lo and behold, the people that was doing it, that was producing it and all that stuff, they cut me out of it. Hmm. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> cut me out of it. Well, uh, for them, it never got picked up. Uh, by any network or anything like that. But to be honest with you, uh, when I was able to do this song and I was going to do it on Rock the Cause Records, the guy, Scott Harold, who owns the label, his big thing was when artists come onto his label and he puts a song out on that's his big thing is, is we want to donate to the charity of your choice. And that struck a bell with me. I said, I've wanted to bring this to the forefront and help in some way. It might not be astronomical, but if it's in some small way, yeah. let me, you know, let me be able to bring about a voice about an epidemic that has been happening, oh my God, for so many years. Um, it, it's, it's, you know what? It's been going on probably a hundred years. And if you think about it in this terms, okay, Native Americans make up maybe just about 10% of the country. And out of that 10%, think about 40% of the women have been missing or murdered. That's a lot. It's an incredible. So yeah. when I got together, when Mark and I decided to do this song um, and realized that the song was written originally, <clears throat> the first draft of it was written originally uh, by myself and Charlie Starr of Blackberry Smoke. And um, then Mark and I took it, uh, developed some other stuff on it, and there's what you got. We put it out, um, and it really was accepted by a lot of, I mean, uh, we got a lot of positive reviews on it. We got a lot of positive feedback, uh, like yourself, you know. Yeah. And uh, we went out, and we played it live. It went down great live. And uh, you know what? I'm just, I'm very happy with it and proud of it that I've been able to do this and just have at least in a small way, have a voice uh, be, of, of this problem <clears throat> and how yeah. I got in, how I found them. Uh, when I knew we were going to do this, I wanted to get a, a legitimate upstanding, you know, uh, organization. So I call my friend, he's like a brother and actually native. We are brothers, but I called up Gil Birmingham who is on Yellowstone. <laughs> he plays the tribal chairman uh, of the Cheyenne Indians. They had done a segment in the third, uh, the third season, I think it was about this subject. Hmm. Um, and also Gil had been in a movie with Jeremy Renner called Wind River, where he played the father of a missing and murdered daughter. Well, I called up Gil and told Gil what I was wanting to do and what I was into doing. And, uh, he said, Ricky, you know what? He said, uh, Taylor Sheridan donates to 
an organization uh, that has something to do with it. Let me talk to him. Let me call him and talk to him. So he called Taylor Sheridan for me. And uh, Taylor called him back and gave him the information. Gil gave it to me, and there you go. And um, you know what? I'm, I'm very happy to be doing this. And on the next song that we put out, uh, I'll still do it. I mean, right on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay steadfast on it. I'm not wavering. And there's a couple of other charities on there. Like I'm involved with <clears throat> a company called Green River Enterprise, which is in Canada. And they have a, uh, they have a, a yearly event called the Dreamcatchers Gala event. Uh, one year they gave me an outstanding, uh, outstanding award in music, lifetime achievement award. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course I'm with the native American music hall of fame. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Robertson, uh, is credited and get me into that. And, um, and then I also love animals, both Stacy and I. Uh, we love animals. We're big into animal, just charities. Uh, and I was so happy. And, believe, uh, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I just saw, and I donate to, um, it's called the WWF uh, Foundation. Uh, and I donate to them for uh, tigers. Uh, Siberian tigers, Bengal tigers. And I just saw where tigers now have made a big comeback. And I just love it. You know, mm -hmm. I just go, yay. You know, um, I love elephants, man. I donate to, uh, you know, ele elephant refuge and um, dogs. We have a couple of dogs, you know, that's like our children. Um, I love all animals. I mean, I really do. Even right down to rattlesnakes. I mean, you know, hey. They all got a purpose. You know what I mean? Um, I don't want to be handling one, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> um, but you know what, man? It's all for, I believe it's all for the betterment of the world, yeah. uh, of where we live in. You know, I wish, I wish people would stop and just think for a minute and try to think about where we're heading. Where are we going? Uh, there's so much, I can't believe all the rhetoric is going on in this world and people just don't stop to think about where we're going. I mean, really? Um, I don't know what kind of train we're on. I don't know if it's a fast train moving in the right direction or a fast train moving in the wrong direction, or it's not even moving or what I, I, I haven't figured it out, but when I do, I'll call you. <laughs> well, no, listen, man, but we need, we need, and we're thankful for, for folk like yourself, um, who, well, who have this recognition are willing to do something about it, to talk about it, yeah. um, to demonstrate, look at if Ricky Medlock can do this, so can you, uh, and yeah. your song never run out of road. It like, it's a very timely, uh, uh, uh part of the calendar that this is this is available to us because may 5th is red dress day which is a day uh to, to yeah. remember, honor missing and murdered indigenous women yeah. and girls, yeah. uh which you know it the red dress day serves as a, a painful reminder of the ongoing genocide yep. and crisis and you you've defined the crisis <laughs> of missing and murdered indigenous women uh, where we invite others into solidarity and action uh with us so Thank you for doing that. And we hope that, uh, you know, we'll oh, put yeah. the links out there for folks to, to grab the song and uh, to help in their part. I mean, Ricky, Ricky Medlock's doing his part. We want to do our part as, as listeners too. Um, look, man, uh, you've got so much going on, Ricky, and you like it that way. <laughs> and, and I like that you like it that way. Uh, with all the things you've told me, I've said before, and you're going to continue to, to inspire, uh, uh, to inspire me, I think, and, and others. Uh, I've mentioned that you have your website, rickymedlock.com, uh, which, by the way, yes. you got some really cool merchandise going on there. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not just saying that. Like, like you've got some, some, um, 
some baby tea stuff and you got the bottle and you got the shirt and the, and the, the hoodie and <laughs> there's just some yeah. cool stuff. And of course, never run out of road. You got the digital download available there. Um, and I love your logo. You've got the, the beautiful feather logo. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage folks to go look at it because it's, it is really cool uh, modern merchandise. Um, so you've got the website is that your place or are you like, do you like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or now it's called X? Um, where do you want fans to go? Well, look, you can go. I, I don't, I like people going to the website because then they can look at the merchandise and, and trust me, people, we are, we take that, the money that's made and we feed it to the charities. And, um, I, you know, I have, and speaking of this, I'm just going to say this. There is a lot of, you know, I'm on, um, I'm on Instagram. I don't get on it often, but um, lately in the last several, several years, there's been so many fake accounts and scammers and, and which has hurt people so bad, uh, has taken advantage of people monetarily and I and I'm just here to tell you I don't do that I I don't if somebody is scamming you saying that they're me they're you're they're awful wrong they're you're wrong they're not me and uh, Johnny and I have spoken out about this on several occasions and posted it on Facebook and Instagram and X and you know our own websites and all that so I do warn people to be very very careful you know but uh, if you head over, um, I got a Facebook thing that somebody runs for me. I'm usually not on there. Um, Stacy will look in on it. And um, I'm not one of these guys to get on there and start an argument. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got more. I got better things to do with we, my time. Rick, Ricky Medlock is on stage. He's not on social media, but, but you you're got you it. Are- you are connected with us. And I, I want to say this too, by the way, uh, the merchandise you have, and you mentioned, hey, you know, we, we funnel some of this stuff to, to the charities as well. The, yeah. the prices you have, I just want people to understand this. Like I, and I'm not going to mention the artist. I was at a concert recently in downtown Toronto, and um, the prices you have are very good rock and roll merchandise prices because <laughs> you will not get these prices for this type of merchandise uh in downtown toronto concerts or, or some of these other places so you're you're right. very you're very fair in in your merchandise and how you're listing it and and knowing that part of it is going to charity so uh i i'm trying to encourage people because if if uh, we know it goes to charity and and you know the prices are, are very fair uh it's just another reason to to go have a look Look, I am so grateful. I kept you a lot longer than you probably intended to be here, Ricky. No, 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 it's okay. So, so uh, I, I, I I've enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank you. I I have. It's a it's an incredible incredible treat, and I I think it is for the listeners as well. Uh, is there anything else before I I do my closeout? Well, you know, if you're are you in Toronto? I am just north of Toronto, Ricky. You know. I go, Stacy and I are going to be at the Dreamcatchers Gala in October. Yes. Uh, they're in Hamilton. Okay. And uh, that's, where the, that's where the charity event takes place for Green River Enterprise. Okay. And uh, yeah, man, it's, it's, we're, we come up there often. So there you go. I'll be right next door to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll send a note over and maybe we can connect in person, Ricky. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Folks, that is Ricky Medlock, member of the Native American Music Hall of Fame, original member of Leonard Skinner and frontman for Blackfoot, now giving us new great music with the Ricky Medlock band. While there's no left turn on a red light, we're sure to find our yeah. highly song together as we never run out of road, even if we have to take the train train. I will have right. Ricky's music sites and contact info in the show notes. Ricky, best of luck with the new material. We love you, and we hope to hear from you again. Thank you. It's been my honor and my pleasure. And uh, you know what? Best to you. What a fantastic segment with Ricky Medlock. Let's get to some music from Blackfoot and Paul Shorty Medlock's Train Train. <laughs>
train. And now before we get to our next segment, let's hear from one of our friends of the podcast, Chasers Fresh Juice. Hi, I'm Richard Chase, introducing Chasers Fresh Juice, a local business in Toronto. We've been in business for over 20 years, initially supporting our local Toronto area and now servicing all of Canada. Chasers provides fresh organic juices, ingredients, including citrus zests, dehydrated garnishes, and fresh citrus peels to enhance any cocktail or recipe you can think of. We have successfully supplied restaurants, distilleries, crop breweries, and bakeries across the country. Reach out to orders at chasersjuice.com for any questions you may have. We are a customized fresh juice company, and I'm sure we can help you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the monthly social self-help segment. I am your host, Guido Prino, and joining me today is author, psychotherapist, and speaker, Phyllis Levitt, who is going to talk to us today about America in therapy. Welcome to the show, Phyllis. Thank you for being here. How are you tonight? I'm really great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, It is my pleasure. I don't know that I've had a guest from New Mexico before. So welcome New Mexico as well. Um, Phyllis, I understand that you've been in psychotherapy in the field, applying your craft in various forms um, for 30 plus years. Um, I'm always interested in in how people um, sort of are on the path that they are on or or have been on. Can you share with us what, what initially attracted you to go in this direction? Uh, And how did you know, how did you know it was the right thing for you? Yeah, you know, um, I think like so many people, I ended up in a career that had personal relevance for me. Um, I had um, uh, some significant trauma in my childhood that I had forgotten, like totally buried. And it really affected the way that I grew up and the way I felt about myself. And when I was in my mid thirties, I, and I had three little children at that point, um, you know, it kind of came crashing down and, you know, and I think this happens for a lot of people. It's like this stuff starts to bubble up from your unconscious because it really like, just like your body will have symptoms because something needs to be healed. And I think our psyches are similar that our, our emotional things will start to bubble up asking for healing. And at that time, um, I knew some people that were going to therapy. And and before that, really, uh, my exposure to psychology and psychotherapy was pretty much, you know, you don't do that. It's kind of a sign of failure or you shouldn't need it or whatever. But uh, some of the people that I knew had turned to uh, going to, to therapy, and I really felt like I needed some help that I couldn't give myself. And I gave it a shot. And Um, And it was really life changing for me because I really at that time and, you know, I'm um, I'm a child of the (laughs) I was born in the in the late 40s. And so, um, you know, when I grew up, the the psychology was just not a language we spoke and no Mm -hmm. one talked about your early childhood or your formative years influencing the rest of your life and how you feel about yourself and the choices you make um, and the places you might feel blocked. So. Um, when that, when that whole area opened up for me and I went to therapy, I began to understand that my childhood had a tremendous impact on what I was experiencing as an adult. And that was really life-changing because up until that point, I had felt like I was just a flawed person. Um, so lots of different puzzle pieces started to come back together and I started reading books on psychology because I was just really interested and um, I decided to go back to graduate school and get my own degree. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. <laughs> it's it's a great story of personal connection and, uh, you know, uh, self-awareness. Uh, it's And I think, you know, I asked the question because sometimes we have um, educators and, and students that will listen in and, and they draw on themselves on the information for career. And, um, you know, just the value proposition of what you put here on the table in terms of your personal connection and understanding, um, you know, how that passion for what you learned about yourself could translate into a, not just a career, but it ended up probably being a career where you're helping others. Mm-hmm. You've also said something else that I um, I thought was really interesting. And 
um, that is the how we've perceived therapy uh, and how that has changed over the years. And, and what a time for you to, to watch right. That transition, right? Where it's I mean, a word that's a little bit mm, therapy. Mm-hmm. Now it's a word that's kind of like, oh, therapy, right? Oh, right. I, I, can, right. I can help myself. And, and, and there's uh, tools and people out there who can help me and kind of go into. So um, it, it's been, it's, I say for you, what an interesting time to watch that, that transition. Right. Um, you have on your website, um, phyllislevitt.com, uh, and I'm going to have that link in our show notes. Great. Um, I was looking through and, and getting to know you as we were approaching the show, um, and you say something on, on the website that when you became a psychotherapist that you never imagined you would one day be entering a political arena. I know we're going to get a little deeper into some of the, these pieces later, but what exactly did, does that mean? Well, I think what there's a couple of things that it means. One, first of all, I still consider myself an introvert. So, you know, have, doing a one-on-one in my office with a client or a family or a couple or a child um, really suited my introvert nature because I really like either to be very internal or very deep with other people, um, with a small number of people. So that's, that's the realm I really saw myself operating in. Um, but what happened for me was that because of the work that I did with so many people and so many families, and I think many, many, uh, psychotherapists could tell you the same thing that even if you're working with one individual, you're actually working with the family of origin and the influence of their family of origin, even if those people aren't in the room. Because just like I was influenced by my parents and what happened to me as a kid, most of us are, for better or for worse. And sometimes it's for good things. But to the extent that we're hurt by people that we depend on, the work really involves reworking what happened with other people so that we're not subject to the negative beliefs or the coping mechanisms that came out of that that don't serve us. So after working with so many people, um, it became really clear to me that um, our family systems are not just our families of origin. There are communities, there are schools, there are places where we work, there, there's our, there are states and there are government and they're actually you know, the world population is our larger and larger levels of family function that we're all conditioned by and, um, and that we suffer from if they're not healthy, if the dynamics are dysfunctional in any of those family units, if they're inhumane, if they're discriminatory, if they're abusive, if they're neglectful, um, we are all affected by that. So I began to see family systems mushrooming out in its influence on the largest levels of our functioning. And in the world we live in today where we're all inundated or most of us are inundated on a daily level with what's going on on all those levels, we can't help but be affected by it. And so seeing that, I felt like a really deep need to speak out about what I was seeing happening in these larger levels of family functioning um, that's hurtful to people because I think many, many, many people today are being seriously hurt, injured, and sometimes we know killed by these dysfunctional dynamics that are happening in these larger and larger family systems that we're all a part of. So, and, and some of that is politics, you know, but I want to take it out of the realm, if I may, for just a minute of partisanship. Um, Partisanship is certainly part of politics today. But when I say I never saw myself in a political arena, I don't mean it from a partisan point of view. I mean, that really everything today is political. Religion is political. Economics is political. Um, Business is political. Social functioning is political. Gender is political. You know, they're all political issues. And so when I say I never saw myself entering that arena, it was like, well, we're all in that arena, whether we think we are or not. And if I'm going to 
if I want to, which I do want to talk about not just the ill family dynamics that are hurting us, but I want to talk about what do we do? How do we break that cycle? What Mm. are healthy family dynamics? What have I learned as a therapist that I could contribute to a healing conversation? Um, So that's that's pretty much what happened for me is that my in, the individual work, my own individual work and my work with individuals just became a lens through which I saw what was going on around me. And I felt like I needed to share that. Well, you've certainly gone outside the comfort and realm of your office space, it seems, as you've um, you know gotten into these different spaces. Um, and we're getting to know you. Part of part of our introduction here is always getting to know the person that we're talking to. Um, and I'm going to go back and ask you as well. You say something else. You say that the the greatest threat to our survival as a country and as a species is our declining mental health. Yeah. And I read that and I think to myself, that's that's pretty bone chilling. That that you would expand those thoughts at the species level, and and somebody reading that might say. Geez, Phyllis, that's really dark. <laughs> that's that's pretty dark. That the, the of an outlook. Um, what got you to that point? Yeah, I think, and again, it's just taking that family systems lens and expanding it outward and looking through that lens. So, but I'm going to talk now. So, I I I say the family, the family like of origin. I'll call that the microcosm. You know, our personal relationships. And our larger communities and our countries and our global community is the macrocosm. Um, So on the microcosmic level in a family, if what, what, what we see in our offices, and I'm, I'm sure that I'm not alone in this as a psychotherapist, you know, massive dysfunction and abuse that people bring to therapy much more than maybe the average one of us would like to know or or thinks is true but over all the years that I have been a therapist people like you and me people who are functioning in their lives they're going to work they're taking their kids to school and they're in deep pain from sexual abuse from physical abuse from emotional abuse from um, you know, discrimination on the playground when they were a little kid um, from addiction and, you know, all kinds of things that that really hurting us. Mm-hmm. And and so what we see in families is when when abuse and neglect is not addressed, when people don't have the opportunity to get help, they don't want help, they can't afford help, whatever the circumstances are, those symptoms escalate for many people, not for everyone, but for many people, they become more helpless because they were overpowered, or they become more addicted because they're trying to numb out their pain, or they become more aggressive because that's the way they think they can survive the best. And they've identified with the power of the people that have hurt them because they don't want to be victimized again. And the more we see this escalating in society, you know, we now have, you know, incredible gun violence mm-hmm. and mass murders in the news every practically every day i mean when i was writing my book um and i was talking about this in my book on my computer at that moment there was a news flash that came up i don't know why it came up but of a, yet another mass murder and at that point there had been more mass murders in the united states than there were days in the year and that was 2023 um and so we're talking about escalating mental ill health, becoming deadly, becoming deadly. And none of us is really safe from that. None of us knows if we're going to be the next person in the shopping mall who happens to be there when someone completely loses it. Um, And that's just the tip of a big iceberg. Um, But why I say that is because on a national and international level, the investment in weapons of mass destruction that we're seeing today um, is an investment in how to kill millions of people. And were we to use the things that we now possess in terms of weaponry, we could destroy life as we know it. And so for me, that's, that's where we've sort of been told that these are partisan issues. You know, one party believes in this and another party believes in that. But actually, 
the investment in that kind of defense structure and also in the ways that we pollute the planet for gain, for immediate gain, um, these are self-destructive. These are self-destructive behaviors and self-destructive beliefs and self-destructive coping mechanisms. And if we were doing these things as an individual, if somebody was poisoning the water in their house, if they were spending all their money on guns instead of food for their children, um, or if they were killing people, we would say they were mentally ill. We would say they were disturbed and we would say it's criminal behavior. Hmm. But somehow there's this gap between what we consider criminal and mentally ill in our own lives and what we condone and allow on, on larger and larger levels of society. And so, you know, if, if what we continue to believe in is that we have to so-called beat the bad guy right. and win the war, the upshot could be a third world war in which none of us survive. And that's a mental illness issue. And we've been all taught to believe it's a, it's a partisan issue. It's an ideological issue. But I would say from a psychological point of view that the, the, the destructive language that's coming out of the partisan divide in, in America today is a sign of mental illness. People are not sitting down and working it out. They're not treating it, each other with respect um, the way we would want people in our own lives to treat us. It's it's interesting because I was going to ask a, a, a follow-up question that said something like, is our mental health so fragile as a nation that it actually threatens our survival? But then when you put that perspective that you just did, what you're actually saying to me, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the actual threats that we've created, mental health was part of the journey that influenced the actual creation of those threats. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And then it perpetuates them. Because as long as we believe that the answer is war, then we're we're prone to keep acting on that. And we see that all over the world. I mean, that is what's happening now. And look at the results Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of innocent people are dying. And it's horrific. Phyllis, when I first saw your profile, what caught my attention was the title of your new book, America in Therapy. Um, and admittedly, without having read it and only going on, on what I see on TV, whether it be the news, the TV shows, the culture, I thought, what a great title for a book. Um, and I wondered if America knows it is in therapy or that maybe it needs therapy. Um, what is it that not only inspired the title, but then the book itself for you? And we got a glimpse of it, I think. But yeah. what is it that inspired it, Phyllis? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it was the original title for my book, which got reduced down to this one, which I really like better. Um, but the original title was Out of My Office and Into the World, because it was really like, I want to take what I've learned in my office about our internal dynamics and our, our, our group dynamics, our family dynamics. I really wanted to make that common knowledge, because I don't know still that even though therapy is much more accepted, I don't know that we know on a societal level that some of the principles that we operate on from the highest levels down government and large institutions and um, other, you know, other institutions of power are really abuse dynamics that are hurting people. Um, and, 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 and even if we know that they're abuse dynamics and they're hurting people, what happens in an individual family where there's abuse is that it's always justified. I hit her because she talked back. I beat him because he got bad grades in school. Right. I molested her because she wore that short skirt. Whatever it is, um, abusive people always justify what they've done and they put it on the victim. Yeah. It's because the victim did this that I did that and I had a right to do it. And we do the same thing on our larger levels. These people are lazy and entitled. Therefore, we have a right to withhold from them or whatever we do. And these are actually abuse dynamics. And the effects of them do not go away. And I can tell you that without any hesitation from my own life 
and from the masses of people that I've worked with that we may compensate, we may survive, we may white knuckle it through, but the lasting effects of being hurt by other human beings do not go away and they show up somewhere. Yeah, there's a, I was thinking there's a transfer of accountability. I see a lot of that transfer of accountability online in the, in the social media circles where people become somebody outside of themselves interacting with other people. And, and there's, uh, I, I don't know if excuse is the right word, but they make up, they justify their behavior based on some event or the behavior of others that they perceive uh, to, to be one, one thing or the other. Um, is there a connection you're expecting people to make when it comes to the message in the book? America in therapy, what would, what would you think would be the main relevancy in their lives as they consume it? Well, I think that there's probably a lot of connections that I hope people will make. And that's why I have a lot of chapters in my book. So, so, um, but one that I, one that I could start with here. So just to know that I can't say all the things I hope that people take away, but, but what a big one is, this that and and this refers to something that I just said briefly, and I'll, I'll expound on it just a little bit. And that is, we live in such a right, wrong, good guys, bad guys kind of world, and it's a really an old paradigm that needs to go, because I think what what we've learned as psychotherapists is that inside the perpetrator is a victim. Mm-hmm. There are victims and there are perpetrators, but people who become massive perpetrators are hurting people. Something happened to them. They weren't born a murderer or a rapist Mm -hmm. or somebody who stole. They weren't born that way. Something happened to them. They either saw those role models or they were really hurt or they were neglected or they were ostracized or they were abused or something happened to them where the messages they got about themselves were painful and negative and the ways that they figured out to cope with their lives were dysfunctional. And for many people, and certainly not all people, and we all know that there are these hero and heroine stories where people have had horrible lives and they've somehow managed to just rise from the ashes like the phoenix. And wonderful. That's fabulous. And I love those inspiring stories. But we have to know that there's thousands of people who don't. And they become highly symptomatic. And the two main symptoms, and I talk about this a lot because I think this is really happening all over the world. It's definitely happening, and and I think it's very obviously happening in America, that more and more people are becoming very passive and feel helpless because they've been so dominated, they've been so hurt, they've been so abused, they've felt so helpless, they've felt so hopeless, they don't see opportunity for themselves, they've maybe been the the subject of, you know, massive injustice, and they're easily manipulated because they've never been able to experience authentic personal power for their own behalf. So they're, they're passive or they're easily controlled or they're easily dominated because that's what they've already been conditioned to be. Not because they're bad people or they're failures or they're less than, but because that's where their experience of other human beings has left them. And equally, there are many, many people who have identified with the aggressor and have become highly aggressive, and they tend to attract each other, you know, from, and again, I would say probably many, many therapists can, can say that this is their experience, either their clients are the more passive person and they've ended up in the relationship with somebody who's very dominating, or their parents were that role model, and they suffered from that. Um, so this thing of the more and more people becoming helpless and easily controlled or easily identifying with the strong guy because they haven't felt any power in their own lives and more and more people identifying with the aggressor, um, is, you know, spells, um, a very bad outcome for our society. We need people who are appropriately empowered but have boundaries and have care for the impact that they have on one another. And when an abuse, when abuse and neglect go unchecked on a family level and on a societal level, we start to erode that sense of, of appropriate personal power with boundaries. And I'll just say one more thing and then please jump in. Part of those boundaries are a commitment to nonviolent conflict resolution. 
You've given me so much. Um, uh, with some hesitation, and we started talking about the political arena earlier and how vast that was. But as you were saying what you were saying, and I'm watching, I, I'm I'm an outsider to America, relatively speaking. I mean, in Canada, uh, you know, we get a lot of American cultural influences because we're just, you know, the border's right there. And, right. and we see the TV and we, you know, the images and the music. And like, it's all very integrated, even though we're two different countries. In that political space, we've watched some of those signs and symptoms that you've said, that you've just talked about. Is that, is that one of the things that's happening where people see themselves powerless and they latch on to something that looks powerful? Um, they see themselves as voiceless and then they latch on to something that they perceive as a voice, whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. And, and I, you know, you went... You said we gotta move away from right and wrong and good and bad. I don't know how to do when it when it comes to those spaces though. Where do people like? How do they distinguish and what do they do? And is that what's happening right now? Well, I think a lot of I, I think yes. I think that's part of what's happening right now. I think what's happening right now is so complex that you can't nail it down to one thing. But I think one more element of what you just described and what I had tried to what I tried to outline is that often in abusive families, and I've seen this upfront and close, you know, personal with clients that I've worked with, one person who might be the target of abuse in a family, because it's not always everybody, sometimes it's one child or the spouse, um, that often the abusive person will um, reward complicity in the abuse. I've had clients who have told me that their siblings were rewarded while they were the one who was um, was beaten or sexually molested. Um, I've even had clients tell me that their the abusive parent enrolled their siblings in holding them down while they were beaten, mm -hmm. and then they were rewarded with more you know more gifts and more freedoms. And we see that happening in in our society as well, that sometimes people are really rewarded for being complicit with abusive institutions and people in positions of authority. Um, and this is extremely dangerous. Phil, is, is partisan politics part of the problem? Well, what I would say is that the beauty of, let me start by saying this, the beauty of psychology is, is that it's not partisan. The whole field of psychology is about healing relationship, healing my relationship with myself, healing my relationship with my significant other or my children or my boss or my colleagues or my friends or what it's all about healing. It's about starting from the place of conflict and divide and maybe huge upset or hurt or anger or whatever it is, and th this is human, we have conflict. That's part of being people right now. That's part of just being human. We're not going to agree on everything. We have different natures, we have different backgrounds, we have different religions and genders and all the different things that we have that bring different points of view to the table. But the whole field of psychology is about bringing us together in safety, in understanding, in empathy and compassion, in learning how to listen deeply the way we want to be heard by others, in reaching compromise or agreement, in making amends for the things that we ourselves have done that are not so great, in taking responsibility for ourselves. These are some of the very important elements of the best psychotherapy today. And um, partisan politics, the way it, we're going to have probably different parties. I think it might be good in America if we had more than two, but, but maybe very good in America if we had more than two. But it's not the fact that we have partisan politics. It's it's the way our mental unwellness is influencing um the partisanship that we have. We're entitled to different opinions. What we don't have is the psychological skills and commitment to sit down and work our differences out, not only for the sake of 
the people in the room, you know, making, having those great divides or differences of opinion or conflict, but for the sake of the family of America. And I say this for a very good reason, because I've worked with many, many people who had highly conflictual parents Hmm. and they really suffered from the tension, from the aggression, from the verbal violence, from the threats, from whatever the lack of love and belonging and safety was in their home, even if that violence wasn't directed at them. Phyllis, Children, when, when, when did I, this start? To, when did this start to percolate? You know, I, I probably don't know when it started. I mean, a lot of people say that the roots of th- these kind of great divides were being were being really uh, grown and fostered many years ago, and they're sort of coming to public attention and, you know, fruition today. You know, it's very, we, we also live in a very much of a society, and I think it's human nature, it's not just America, where we have a great investment in having more of whatever it is we want. And more means more wealth, more power, more sex, more influence, um, and sometimes it's more righteousness. And it's very possible to have more and more of those things today. Mm-hmm. And, and so we see people who are really addicted to power and they don't want to let go and they are not willing or able to see the impact of what they're doing by wielding so much uncontrolled power on masses of people, just like an abuser in their own home or a dysfunctional person in their own home. Is there some element of sociopathy in what you just said? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, I don't know if you ever heard of Barbara Marks Hubbard, but she, she died a couple of years ago, but she was, she was both very spiritual and kind of into, you know, personal development. And she also had been involved in politics. And I heard her speak one time and she had been in Washington. And I think at one point she had even either been on the vice presidential ticket or was a candidate for being a vice presidential candidate. And anyway, what she is, so she had really been in Washington and been immersed in the whole political scene there. And she said something very profound and also probably pretty obvious. She said, that her experience was that human beings just simply cannot le- manage the level of power that they that they try to have. We just psychologically are not able to manage it. We need to share power with one another. We need to have lots of people at the table. And that's exactly what good psychotherapy does. It brings everybody to the table. So we've we've given each other some examples and we've talked about in some ways, how um, it has become increasingly clear that we've got divisiveness, we've got hatred, um, there's violence that is escalating. But more importantly, because I think you, you've you've kind of touched on that, what do we do with that information? So I'm going to read your book, and I'm going to get this information. What do I go and do with this information that that will help change divisiveness and hatred and violence? Well, I think the easiest answer and the most accessible answer is to apply what we've learned in our own lives. We can all use an upgrade. And I speak for myself. I'm married to a wonderful man. And we can still trigger each other. Okay? We still have our little arguments over who said what and how we're going to manage, you know, cook the fish or whatever it is, right? <laughs> because we're because we're fallible human beings because sure. we, you know, I I I like I like to share, you know, that like Part of his wounding as a child was to really be dominated and hurt. And part of my wounding as a child was to feel invisible and unheard. And those two wounds fit together, you know. So he wants his voice and I want mine. And it can erupt over the littlest thing. But, you know, we have <laughs> – you're laughing. Tell me tell me why you're laughing. <laughs> well, because, you know, like uh, it, our culture, like those things, you know, being Italian and we've watched them – We've wa- I've watched those things happen, but they were all, we, we all knew we were coming back from it, right? Like my gra- I watched my grandparents have those little tiffs, and, but I knew they were coming back from it. And, right. and my parents and even ourselves growing up, right? And it's, you know, the cooking thing made me laugh because we should cook it this way. No, we should cook it that way. No, I want to do it this way. And then, you know, you look at each other and you kind of laugh and, and, but 
there is always this, there's something underlying that we've had in these relationships that we can come back from it, that we don't get to that eroded, escalated (laughs) next step. And that, and that's the perfect point, because that's what I was going to say is we have that container. We know we're going to come back from it and we might bumble our way around for a little bit, but we know we're going to come back to love and connection. And one of us will always go first if the other one's, you know, holding back. Um, And we do, and it builds trust and we can count on that. But I have to say that many people don't have that in their relationships. Mm. There's a very high divorce rate among people who have no skills, no tools, and no way to come back from what appear to be very small arguments because the underlying issues are deep wounds that have not been healed. And so you, that's what, you know, that's what, what brings a lot of people to therapy. That's what brings a lot of couples to therapy is that they might've been fighting about how to cook the fish, but they were really fighting about, you know, very deep unmet needs in their childhood. And, um, and, and so the whole point of good psychology and good psychotherapy is to help us heal those wounds now. So we don't pass them on. As we're talking about what people are doing in society, what they're doing to each other, um, you know, you gave some great examples um, in terms of the family unit and how that extends into what's going on in all the different arenas in, in society. What is missing from from that policy that 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 would help us with the conflict resolution, Phyllis? Well, again, I think that there's many things, but I I will zero in on something that I do go into detail in my book um, because I think it's something that we can all work with in our own lives. And like I said, where does it start? It starts with us. The more aware we are of healthy human dynamics, the more we're able to embody them. And again, I I really want to repeat, none of us does it perfectly. I don't do it perfectly. I don't know anybody who does. But if I have something to come back to, and this goes to what you you were saying about, you know, you're in a container that's basically safe. You know you're going to work it out. Mm -hmm. If you're in a container that's basically safe, then you've already developed some kind of skill to make it that safe. And the biggest, the single biggest healing element in that regard is taking personal responsibility instead of blame. Right. What can I do that can make a difference in this conflict? And so I'll break it down um, into some very digestible parts and 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 I think you know they're 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 it's nothing new. It's just that we don't think this way because we're so invested, most of us are so invested in being right. <laughs> I'm right and you're wrong, and I'm going to show you how wrong you are, right. and I'm not going to stop until you agree. Right. Right? Yeah. I will have no other, I will have no other, I will not hear anything that you say because right. I'm right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the problem is the other person feels exactly the same way. Right. So you're just in conflict and it escalates or it divides you and you hate each other or you feel completely mistreated and misperceived and, you know, all the things that we can feel. Um, when we don't have any way to actually listen. So when I say, and I, and I really think this is the hardest thing for human beings, yeah. honestly. I think it's the hardest thing for human beings to take full responsibility for themselves. And that means if I'm angry at you, and I may, I may feel, and I may be very justified in being angry at you or very feel very justified that I was hurt by you or that you blah, blah you know, whatever it is that I, my issue is with you. Um, it's still my responsibility to restrain myself in terms of the way I react. Do I scream at you? Do I roll my eyes? Do I slam the door and walk out of the room? Do I call you names or, you know, do I subtly put you down or overtly put you down? Um, do I bring up every single bad thing you ever did, you know, for the last 30 years I can be responsible for restraining my most impulsive and dysfunctional reactions to Mm -hmm. you. If we did that by itself, and that's just step number one, but if we did that by ourselves, we wouldn't have war. 
We wouldn't. We wouldn't have the kind of police brutality that we have. We, we, we wouldn't have so many things because the bottom line underneath everything I'm about to say is that what really heals is if I treat you the way I want to be treated. Right. Period. Period. Is that, is that the gap, the healing gap between love and politics? Yeah. Yeah. That we allow and condone and perpetrate on other people things that we would consider criminal if they happen to us. Do you see our ability to make this happen anytime soon? So, you know, I like to think, I, I like to think that anything is possible. I believe that there is hope. And, and like I said, you know, when someone is in enough pain, if collectively we could actually feel our collective pain, I think anything is possible. And so part of why I wrote my book is to try to like open that door to actually feeling the impact of the pain that we're now perpetrating on each other, but not for the purpose of blaming anybody, mm. the purpose of Okay, let's, you know, our appendix is bursting as a society. Are we going to have surgery? Or are we going to let it burst? And so that's, that's how I see it. I think there's always hope, but I think we need tools and we need skills and we need a new understanding of what actually heals. So interestingly, and I'll share with you, uh, you know, myself, as I do these shows and I've got multiple, multiple shows online and you know, mm. I engage online and people will engage with me. You, you put yourself out there, right? You put yourself out there, you present different, um, different topics and opinions and not everybody always agrees with you. And, and, right. and not everybody is always nice to me, right? They will, right. they will attack me in different ways. Uh, I had one instance where I think one gentleman started, uh, there's something wrong with your hair and how could you come on camera with your hair that way? <laughs> and I read these things and I, I laugh. Right. You know, I have two choices there. I'm going to either come back at this person with something or ignore them or or maybe something else. And I tried the something else, which is, hey, thanks for thanks for your comment. I hope that everything's OK. Um, you know, happy to hear your opinion on the topic. And that went on. So then I got another response and the person still attacked and I still thanked them. Right. Because now now I'm in experiment mode because I want to see. Is there any way I can get this individual to stop the attack, focus on what we're actually talking about, and in any kind of way show kindness or, or, or acknowledgement of any kind? With that particular one, it was up to about the fifth message of me just being kind. All I did was reciprocate kindness, right? Hey, it's okay. I understand you're angry about, about what you know, we're talking about here. I appreciate that you're angry. And that you're coming across, have you thought of this? And thank you for sharing your anger. And, and, you know, they stopped. They couldn't take it anymore. They they saw that I wasn't going to bite on the on the anger. And they just, I, they're like, this person, it doesn't matter what I say to them. It doesn't matter what I call Guido. I'm how He's not going to get angry at me. He's not giving me the anger back, right? Right. I've had others where they stop and they go, oh, wait, you're not attacking me back. You're listening to me. You're you're going to uh, absorb what I'm saying and and maybe even consider it, right? And so these two little pockets. So as I see what you're presenting here, and as I look at some of those things that I've done, I have a little bit of hope <laughs> that that you've come up with a formula that we can apply. Exactly, and, and we have some examples, Phyllis. So you just gave a beautiful example of being what I said. The bottom line is that we, we focus on our own personal responsibility and that's what you did. You took responsibility for your response. You could have grabbed the bait. You yeah. could have yelled, you could have insulted the person. You could have put them down. You could have done anything, but that's not what you were committed to. And so your commitment was to being open, being, you still had a boundary. You didn't it, have the bait, um, but you were understanding and you were peaceful and that's what you put out into the space and eventually it worked. So 
what everything that I'm talking about is is about that. And so I'll just outline the first the first element was restraint of our, you know, and that's what you did. You restrained your worst impulses. Yeah. If you had them, maybe you didn't have them. But um, and the second one is that we sort of reflect on ourselves. Well, who am I being here? Maybe my tone. And this doesn't apply to your example because you, yeah. you do beautifully. But but, you know, in a in a conflictual situation with somebody who's you're intimate with, who you can easily get triggered by, let's say, you know, the second step is like reflecting on yourself, taking a deep breath. Like, who am I being here? Am I being kind of aggressive? Am I being intolerant? You know, am I rolling my eyes or, you know, doing something with my body posture or my tone of voice that actually is off-putting or, you know, is in some way a put down of you or dismissive of you. So I reflect on what I'm doing that might be contributing to the conflict. It doesn't mean I'm responsible for what you did, but I'm not focused on that. Just like you weren't focused on what the other person was doing. You were focused on you and who you wanted to be. So self-reflection goes right along with the next thing, which, which I've already said, which is I take responsibility for me. So if I really didn't speak to you in a nice tone of voice, can I make amends for that? Can I say, you know, I am upset with you, but I'm sorry I talked to you in that tone of voice. Because I don't want you to talk to me in that tone of right. voice, right? Yeah. So the, the fourth element is really like making some kind of amends if it's appropriate. Um, and if it's not appropriate, if you have a stand that you feel really just needs to be said, like, I don't want you to talk to me the way you did. I can still be responsible for how I communicate that to you. Do I scream it at you? Do I tell you you're a jerk? Or do I tell you that's not acceptable to me? That's okay. We can do that. And the the fifth element is that I'm committed to finding some kind of reconciliation with you, some kind of agreement, some kind of way forward, because what I'm, the commitment is that we're going to somehow reconnect as best we can, right. you know, and if in, and so what can I agree to? What would you be willing to agree to rather than stomping out or slamming the door or, you know, and even if I have to take a time out, cause I'm really upset with you, I can take a time out and say, I'll come back and talk to you later when I have calmed down, not when you have calmed down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And then the last one is whatever we can do to reconnect, whatever I can do to reconnect with you. I was a witness to an altercation between two people I really love recently. Mm -hmm. And, um, and at one point, one of them just reached out and put their hand on the other person's back in a very loving way. And it shifted the entire conversation. Right. After that, they worked it out beautifully. So, you know, that person took responsibility in a way that was just a loving gesture. It's so easy to take responsibility if that's what our mindset is. And I like to imagine, you know, like in the highest reaches of government, and, you know, because so much of that is witnessed now in social media, how people mm -hmm. talk to each other and what they say and they walk out and they say all these deprecating things or whatever they do. Um, what if they were role modeling that of like, how am I, to, who am I being in this conversation? How could I change the conversation just by the way I talk to you, which is what you did. Right. And one of the things I say is one person can change the whole dynamic. They can. It, it's been a goal of mine, Phyllis. As I as I do this show, um, it's been it's become sort of a goal to say, look, uh, we don't have to agree, but can we at, can we start at being respectful, and can we start at being truthful, right? And right. I always say there's a difference between being truthful and being honest because we all, we all have our own version of honesty depending on on where we want to go. But being right. factual and being truthful and being respectful, uh, I, I've been trying to, uh, you know, promote those as as building blocks. Now, I feel the things that you just told us, um, I feel like you went into the toolbox and you just gave us a whole bunch of tools of, of you know, what we could what we could reach in and, and, and try and use for ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, so deep into this part of the conversation, uh, don't get mad at me for asking. What I won't get mad at you for anything. <laughs> what has prevented people from using those tools? And you've given us different answers, but if you summarize it, 
in a way that I know you probably can, what has prevented people from using those tools that if they did, we would have different outcomes? Yeah. And just know that everything I say in answer to any of your questions is only a partial answer because there's so many different ways to approach all the things that you said. So please don't take anything I say as like, this is, you know, the word of God and this is all you need no, to do. We we want to, we yeah. want to apply situational awareness, right, Phyllis? That, right. That's what it For is. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And just know that there's lots of things to be said about each thing. Um, but, but your question is why don't we apply these things? Um, what's prevent, yeah, what's prevented people from applying these things. And if they, if we could tell them that, and you kind of have, but if you could summarize telling them that maybe they will, maybe they'll have that self-reflection moment where they go, I, I remember this show with Phyllis and, and I need to reach into my toolbox. Right. And what can I, yeah. So hopefully I can remember a few things here because there, there are a few things that come up for me when you ask that one of them is that I do think that most of us grew up believing that there's just right and wrong. And we're just supposed to stand our ground and fight for what's right. And, you know, even to the death kind of the death of the relationship or the whatever. And I, and it's just a really bad role model model for human relations. It's, there's nothing wrong with standing up for what you, what's, what you believe in. But one of the things that I've learned so deeply as a psychotherapist is, and, and I'm not the first person to say this, I'm reiterating something that I learned. And that is that you can be right, or you can have a relationship. Hmm. And, you know, just having to be right is, can be relationship killing. Um, because both people think that they're right. And so one of the things that I've, I've learned this in my marriage, and I've learned this as a psychotherapist, that yes, you know, I do want to stand up for myself when I think that's appropriate. And there's things that really need to be addressed. Um, and the commitment to reconnecting, the commitment to hearing each other eventually, if not right away, the commitment to reconciling and and actually recommitting to our love for one another is a much better experience than just walking away right. And I think we need to have that experience and embody it to know that sometimes it's just really better to let go. Um, And again, I'm not talking about letting go of something that feels abusive or or that, but, um, but really like, okay, is it, you know, I've, I've been writing about this stuff ad infinitum and talking about it. And my husband and I were having a, just a difference of opinion about how to handle something. And I thought to myself about what I've been saying. And I thought, reflect on yourself, Phyllis, reflect on yourself. And the minute I did that, I thought, you know what? I don't even have to be attached to this. He wants to buy one thing. I want to buy another one. I said, so I said to him, well, why don't we do it your way? And if it really doesn't work for me, would you be willing to reconsider? And of course he was like, yes, you know? Right. Um, and sometimes it's not that easy, yeah. but sometimes it really is. Yeah. Um, so, but, so one of the things that I think really gets in the way is, is I'm right and you're wrong. And that, and we've grown up on that model and it's deeply ingrained in us. Um, but another thing that I think is that I think we, we don't have the right model for admitting that maybe we're off kilter like you know so so people sometimes get really stuck in a position even when they know that they should be listening to their partner or that there is another point of view but it's like our pride gets in the way because we have to win the argument or i don't want to admit that i that i you know maybe i was actually really wrong about what i said and i'm telling you it's hard to do like like that it it seems silly in hindsight but just look at the other person and say you know what I really did kind of screw up or I really did talk to you in a not nice way and I'm sorry it's like and and so we we sort of associate shame with that instead of celebrating it wow I could be accountable for myself and could and you could and we could celebrate that in our relationship yeah, Instead of walk away with your tail between your legs kind of thing, you know, because like, oh, my God, I did a horrible thing. Um, so I think those are some of the reasons I think people. But I also think one of them we talked about earlier, which is people get really invested in having power and control and they don't want to let it go. Yeah. And and it's just I think it it we get into a, a value system of what that power is and what it means and why I need it. 
And then we go back to the roots that you've brought up in right. terms of our, you know, like we talked about pain and some of the things that, that are, are rooted in, in perhaps our experiences. Phyllis, you say that your book, America in Therapy, offers hope. Does it? Yeah, because, and I, I'll say it very simply, you know, I did a really long healing journey myself and, and I would just say, and I, I'll probably be on that healing journey for the rest of my life. I don't think we arrive, you know, I think it's a process. Um, but I'm not living in the dark night of the soul the way I was in my thirties. And it's because I was able to reach out for help and I got help and I was able to do, to release some of that pain of my childhood. And I was able to learn some of these skills and do things differently and by trial and error, you know, and, and over time accept my own humanity, which means I'm not going to do it perfectly and it's okay. And believe me, that one's still challenging. I still, I still have a model of perfection. I try to hold myself to, um, I just, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Um, and so if there's hope for me yeah. there, and I've seen so many people do incredible healing work on abuse that you can't even imagine. Like, I mean, I've heard stories from people that seem like they would be in the movies of something that you wouldn't really believe happens to people. People have suffered really horrible abuse and neglect yeah. and witness violence um, and been the subject of violence and come through it because they've felt loved and they felt safe and they had a container to release that pain and release some of the negative beliefs they took on about themselves and learn new coping mechanisms and experiment with them and recreate their lives. And if there's hope for individuals, then there's hope for us as a country because our country is individuals. That's what it is. Yeah. Phyllis, um, I hope that anybody who's listened to our segment here would want to pick up your book based on everything that you've told because we've got toolboxes and we've got a wealth of knowledge and it seems applicable in so many of the different facets of, of our lives um, depending on where you've seen yourself in our conversation today. And it could be way over here where it's something very big and very serious, or it could be way over here where it's something very simple, like online conflict and conversation and just day-to-day -day things. But you've certainly run the gamut for us. Where is the best place for our listeners to pick up your book, America in Therapy? Oh, thank you so much for asking. Yeah, it's available from all the major booksellers. You can buy it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and any other online bookstore, you know, book services. It's available. So, um, and you can also order it directly right off of my website, which is www.phyllislevitt.com. Wonderful. And we'll, we'll splash that on the, uh, on the notes as well. I have consumed way more of your time than I think I planned when I, and people know, like I usually th say, I have a set of questions I'm going to ask the guests. Um, <laughs> I probably have gone off and veered off into so many other different uh, things. So thank you for your patience as I've done that. Um, are there, uh, and I'm so thankful for that. Are there anything, uh, is there anything else that you would like to leave us with before I do let you go, Phyllis and, and, uh, yeah. Well, I just really want to thank you. And you didn't take up too much of my time. I love sharing about this. I want to reach as many people as possible because I feel like people are hungry for a different way to look at what's going on in the world. And I think people are especially hungry to feel that there's something they can do. And what I would say is, anything you can do to heal yourself is a contribution to everyone. And any little act of kindness, patience, tolerance, celebrating someone else's differences, just being open to a new idea, saying thank you, acknowledging somebody for a little service they perform, telling somebody they look good in blue, whatever we do that really lifts each other up instead of pushing each other down is a service to all of us. And I think, you know, I'll just end with this, that, that, 
that one of the big takeaways for me of working on my book, America and Therapy, and being a therapist and working with family systems was that the part and the whole are inextricably related. So who we are as parts of this human puzzle influences the whole. And the healthier the whole, the happier and safer and healthier we are. And so we each have a part we can play and everybody's part counts. Giving us a sense of love and belonging is Phyllis Levitt, author, psychotherapist, and speaker, who has shared with us her professional and personal insights through her recent book, America in Therapy. You can find out more about Phyllis and how to get her new book, as well as other helpful resources at phyllislevitt.com. I will have her contact information in the show notes. Again, thank you, Phyllis, so much for doing this and take care. Thank you. The conversation with Phyllis was absolutely spectacular. There's actually more to it than what I was able to fit on today's show. So watch when I produce the video because there's some extra tidbits for you. And indeed, I'm hoping that she will come back and we can continue that conversation. Um, The book's going to be fantastic, folks. Uh, So next, I want to get to another segment. I know typically we mix it up a little bit differently, but I do have some longer segments uh, for this month. So I'm going to share with you Uh, my uh, piece on being nicer and the benefits of being nice um, and how to be nicer. So we'll do that and then we'll close the show out with some Ricky Medlock music. How to be nicer, a guide to kindness. In a world where people often prioritize personal success and material wealth, the importance of being nice can sometimes be overlooked. It's especially hard to find sometimes online where there is a keyboard and miles of Wi-Fi hops between each other. However, being nice is not just about making others feel good. It also has profound effects on our own well-being. There are practical ways to be nicer and spread kindness in our daily lives, as well as understand the benefits of being nice to help enrich each other's lives. Before we delve into how to be nicer, it's crucial to understand what being nice means. Niceness is a character trait that involves being kind, considerate, and respectful to others. It's about showing empathy, listening to others, and treating people with kindness regardless of who they are or what they have done. So, what are five ways to be nicer? 1. Practice empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. By putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, we can better understand their perspective and respond in a kind and compassionate manner. That means asking ourselves, what if it was me going through whatever experience the other person is going through, and then responding in a supportive manner? 2. Listen actively. Active listening involves fully focusing on, understanding, and responding to a speaker. It's a powerful way to show respect and understanding, making the speaker feel valued and heard. Active listening also means not being distracted by your smartphone, other conversations, or changing the subject while you give the speaker your full attention. Body language also matters as you leave your arms uncrossed, lean slightly forward, having awareness over your facial expressions, and avoiding fidgeting. Three, show appreciation. Expressing gratitude is a simple yet powerful way to be nicer. Whether it's thanking someone for their help or appreciating their positive qualities, showing appreciation can make a big difference in someone's day. Finding opportunities to say thank you, simple compliments, or even a smile and nod if someone holds a door open for you. 4. Be respectful. Respect is a fundamental aspect of being nice. It involves acknowledging others' rights, values, and beliefs, even if they differ from our own. You can be nice, even if someone has different views or beliefs than yourself, by demonstrating respect for your differences. 5. Help others. Helping others, whether through small acts of kindness or larger deeds, is a direct way to be nicer. It not only benefits the recipient, 
but also fosters a sense of community and connection. Being nicer can take more time, awareness, and effort, all things that sometimes we feel in short supply of. It's not something that always comes naturally to everyone, especially with all the different challenges presented to us daily with money, health, politics, education, the environment, inflation, shrinkflation, and even entertainment. We're always looking for someone to blame, sometimes the wrong person just because they're the easy target. Here's a little secret for life. If you don't know it already, sometimes good things take some work. Perhaps you're even so angry that you think, why should I make someone else's day better when my day sucks? Well, being nicer to others also has benefits for yourself. Being nice to others has numerous benefits, not just for the people we interact with, but also for our own well-being. Here are some key benefits. 1. It increases happiness. Kindness has been shown to increase subjective well-being and improve mood. The more kind we are, the more we tend to feel positive emotions. 2. Boosts social relationships. People who show kindness are more likely to develop genuine connections with others and to feel content with their social networks. 3. Promotes oxytocin. Oxytocin, commonly referred to as the love hormone, can support positive self-esteem. It helps us feel more joy and can also improve heart health by reducing stress. Four, reduces depressive moods. Being kind to others can help you feel more self-confident and energetic, which can elevate your mood and help minimize feelings of depression. Five, produces the helper's high. Researchers have shown that when we do good deeds for others, our brain's pleasure and reward centers fire up. Being kind can create a rush of positive energy and uplift us. Six, improve support networks. Helping others can also improve our support networks and encourage us to be more active. This in turn can improve our self-esteem. 7. Less stress. When you are nice, you experience less stress. 8. More energy. Being nice to others can give you more energy as you're not so drained by negativity. 9. Better self-perception. Being nice makes you feel better about yourself. And 10. A healthier life. Being nice to others can contribute to a healthier life. Remember, every act of kindness, no matter how small, can make a big difference. So let's strive to be nicer and spread kindness wherever we go. Being nicer is a choice that we can make every day. It requires empathy, active listening, appreciation, respect, and a willingness to help others. By choosing to be nicer, we can create a more compassionate, understanding, and kind world. This is an opinion article by me, Guido Prino, of the Monthly Social Podcast. You may also find its written form on guidoprino.com forward slash blog. There you go. Lots of reasons to be nicer as I cover that off for you. And I hope you enjoyed that. And if you want the written version, head on over to guidoprino.com forward slash blog. And of course, you can uh, access it there. Now, I said I was hoping to do a little bit of sports, but unfortunately, running out of time for this episode. Um, Lots of great content for you, like usual. Um, So I'm going to do uh, some of the sports pieces over on thecoachescall.com. So please, head on over there and enjoy that. Thank you again for being here this month. And if you haven't had a chance to, please consider subscribing. It's free. And you get uh, notified whenever I put out a new show, which is once a month usually. But uh, happy to have you around long term. And let's close out the show with um, Ricky Medlock's new song. Um, Remember, portions of this um, are dedicated to uh, charity in honor of uh, murdered Indigenous women as we observe Red Dress Day. It's a good time um, to have that reflection. So here is Ricky Medlock with Never Run Out of Road. I know that I 
every mile there's a story And never running out of road To the good Lord leads me home Southern winds carry me with the same old wicked temptations that lights the fire of the me. I've got that reason for moving on, and I'll never run out of road. The truth will lead me on. I've got good reason. Got my